Hey there, Sports History fans. Arnie Chapman here from the Sports History Network to share with you an awesome announcement. Now dig on this. Four of our amazing podcasts have clinched spots in the final round of the Sports Podcast Awards, and we need your support to take home the trophy. First up, we've got Basketball History 101 driving the lane in the best basketball category. Then on deck, we've got Orville Mulligan Sports Writer. He's cracking up the competition in the best sports comedy category. Marty's Illegal Stick is dominating the ice next in the best hockey category. And last but not least, we have Wrestling with Heels on powerbombing its way to victory in the best wrestling category. Now, again, we're counting on you to cast your vote and help out these incredible podcasters secure their well-deserved recognition. It's super easy. All you got to do is head over to the dedicated landing page. That's at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash vote. Again, that's sports. HistoryNetwork.com forward slash vote. Now, let's take another look at sports yesteryear with this episode brought to you by, of course, the Sports History Network. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Hello, old sports. Welcome to the Hello Old Sports podcast on the Sports History Network. I am Dan Newman. I'm joined by my brother and my colleague and co-host, Andrew Newman. And Andrew, how are you doing this evening? Doing well, Dan, as we're recording this, it's just a couple of days before Thanksgiving. Um, although I realized maybe I should stop with these time and place things because I was editing an episode yesterday uh, that we recorded a while ago. And I was talking about how the Cleveland Indians had the longest World Series drought uh, at 1948. And the next closest team was the Texas Rangers uh, because they had not won since they came into the league, That's which is <laughs> several, which is several weeks out of date at this point. There's really nothing I could do about that, so I just kind of edited it. I just left it in there. But um, as we're recording this, it's the it's Tuesday night before Thanksgiving, so very short week at work for me at least. I didn't work yesterday either, so. I'm excited in honor of the topic tonight being during prohibition. I just have some water in my glass. I may have Maureen sneak me in some alcohol through the window later, but for now, just <laughs> water. So, yeah, that it is. Uh, we're coming to the end of the year here. Obviously, we're recording right before Thanksgiving. and This will likely post sometime in December. So it's uh, towards the end of the year of uh, the year 2023. And that means a couple of things. First of all, it is almost time for the annual Hello Old Sports in memoriam episodes, which we will begin recording probably within the next week or so, where we honor many of the uh, sports lives, great players and other figures that lost their lives, passed away in the year 2023. If you would like to be a part of that, if you're a listener and you have somebody who passed away, an athlete, a player, somebody who meant uh, something specific to you that you'd like to talk about, we'd love to have you on. Drop us a line. Hello, old sports at Gmail dot com or you can find us on Facebook at Hello, old sports podcast. Uh, we, we've managed to kind of grow this every year to where last year I think we had uh, seven or eight of our, of our colleagues from the Sports History Network join us to talk about somebody. So we'd love to have not only our colleagues, not only some family members and friends, but also some some listeners as well. So drop us a line uh, either on email or uh, via Facebook uh, for that. It also means that we have one more anniversary episode to do we'd like to every year a couple uh times at least go back in time and uh talk about a year that's having some sort of an anniversary whether it's 25 40 60 80 whatever and in the past we've done 1920 we've done uh, 1941 1986 what what other ones have we done? 20, 41, 86, 1998. I feel like there might be another one that I'm missing there. But uh, we did the 47 World Series, mm -hmm. not the whole year 47. Um, yeah, I don't I'm trying to. Uh, are we have we have. Is this the furthest back one? No, we did 1920. Didn't we? Did you say that? The, the, yeah, this is the furthest back. We did 20. Like I said, we did 20. We did 41. <laughs> We did 86 and 98, but I feel like there's another one that we did that I'm missing. Well, anyway, if you're a fan, you can look it up. So 
But tonight we're going to travel back a hundred years in time to the year 1923 and talk about the sporting landscape and the very important events of 100 years ago in the world of sports. Yep. And obviously going this far back, you know, you're not going to have too much professional basketball. You're not going to really have too much college basketball either, although it existed. The Stanley Cup thing gets a little confusing, um, but, you know, you'll have some golf, some tennis, some auto racing. Obviously, baseball is by far the big thing we're going to spend a lot of time on. But, um, you know, there's definitely some other stories that will uh, will sort of dot the landscape with um, and did. Do we have President Harding? Is he going to come on? No, because he died uh, in 1923, a full 100 years ago. So he is not uh, he is not available tonight. OK, fair enough. So, yeah, we'll uh, we'll get into a lot of the different stuff. Um, where do you want to kick it off? You know, why don't we take it? The X Games? I don't think there were any X Games. I don't think even many of those sports existed. I guess skiing probably existed. <laughs> But other than that, probably, probably not much. So given that uh, this was very different, usually we sort of try to sort of tent pull these where it's we start off with one of the big three. Usually, usually we've sort of started with football and ended with baseball or the other way around. But or, you know, so I think, you know, maybe snuck the NBA in there for some of the, the later ones. But given that both basketball and football were not necessarily major factors here, we're going to end with baseball. But why don't we start with maybe what was the second biggest sport in the country at the time? Why don't we start with boxing? And and just to clear it up, normally what we start with is the NBA. And especially if it's an, a season in the last 50 years that you have any memory of or comments on we are 28 minutes into this episode and you are talking about a second round playoff series and i text maureen that i'm going to be probably in here very late tonight <laughs> that's that's usually the pace that we go at but um and of course so, i just forgot the other one we did last year was 40 years my f- celebrating my 40th birthday we did 1982 so 1923 in boxing there's obviously you know, boxing is, is like you said, probably the second most popular sport in the country. There's many different things that I'm sure a boxing historian would discuss. We'll kind of just keep it to the main, you know, the heavyweight division and, and the main character and the main fight, unless you had something else. But so in 1923, did you have anything you wanted to get to before? I- you know, I had I looked and I could find nothing of particular interest mm. outside the heavyweight realm. So, yeah, well, let, let's keep with uh, keep with the heavyweight championship and the Manassa mm. Mauler, Jack Dempsey. So Jack Dempsey, and it's interesting because to me, he's so associated with the 20s, like, you know, the him and Ruth and Bill Tilden and and uh, Bobby Jones and all of those guys that you forget that really, I mean, he did not fight that much after 1921. In fact, his last fight before 1923 was in July of 1921. He fought George Carpentier, who is an interesting name because he also went on to have a claim for the, uh, or am I thinking of, no, I'm thinking of Edouard Carpentier, the, uh, the wrestler in the, in the twenties, but so he beats George Carpentier in 1921 and does not fight again until July 4th, 1923. So he's still the reigning heavyweight champion of the world, uh, but not fighting actively the whole year in 1922. His first fight back is in 1923 against Tommy Gibbons. It's held on the 4th of July in the town of Shelby, Montana. And have you heard about any of the the lead up to this particular fight? So first of all, uh, we should mention that Tex Rickard, who's Dempsey's promoter and is also very heavily involved uh, later on with boxing at Madison Square Garden and in the New York area. He doesn't want Dempsey to fight all that often. He's sort of trying to limit Dempsey's fights so that they're events so that it broadens the appeal and that when he does fight, it draws a larger gate. Also, throughout 1922, Shelby is dealing with some of his own legal troubles. Uh, I think uh, from what I read, 
involved some sort of inappropriate contact and relationship, perhaps with uh, with with underage girls, girls who were 15, that type of thing, which was more common in those days, probably, if we're being honest. So those are some mm-hmm. of the reasons why Dempsey doesn't fight in 1922. And then you, I, you can fill me in a little bit more, but they go for this fight against Gibbons in Shelby, Montana, and there's just all sorts of issues with getting the fight financed. So the whole point was that it was in 1922, the year before there was oil discovered in Shelby and people who they decided to basically try and like make based on that, make Shelby like a metropolitan hub, despite the fact that it was in northern Montana. But I guess the thinking was that it was close enough to California and the West Coast, which was, you know, still in its infancy compared to what it would be even 20 years later. But they want to try and get big events, bank branches opened there. You know, they they were really thinking they could turn this into sort of a tourist hub and then a major metropolitan area. So one of the things they want to do, and it's almost reminiscent, not in the same way, but like not in the same like political context. But when you think about, you know, we did an episode talking about Ali and Burbick in Jamaica. And then, of course, there was the thrill in Manila and the Philippines with Ali and Frazier and the the fight in Zaire. You know, this is almost an early version of that, of like, well, we'll do it in a location to put that location on the map. And like a lot of those, there was a reason that it wasn't done all that often. And that's because it wasn't very much of a success. Um they figured they would attract people by getting Dempsey there. Maybe famous people would come to see the fight. They're not able to really get a marquee challenger to Dempsey. Um, Gibbons is not a, a well-known name outside of boxing circles. So he's, he's a, he's a, yeah, go he's ahead. Six years older than Dempsey and he's mostly been a light heavyweight. Yeah. So, you know, th- there's lots of match machinations going on at the beginning you know, the wanting the money up front. Um, Gibbons ultimately, he took one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which in 1923 money to fight is a is a big deal. They end up the fight is scheduled for 15 rounds. The ultimate uh, decision is Dempsey gets a unanimous decision in 15 rounds. It's not a very action packed fight. Um, you know, one of those where you kind of see that the one fighter is the more skilled fighter and is not necessarily looking to knock the other guy out, but you know, basically just you, you would see this a lot with Floyd Mayweather fights where it would be clear a couple rounds in that the other guy couldn't obviously haven't seen film of this fight to judge it, but it was clear that Dempsey was just a better fighter and he didn't, you know, he could just outpoint him and, and keep him at a distance. And, you know, all of that might be good technical boxing, but it doesn't, lend itself to the spectacle you're looking for when you're creating a heavyweight championship, when you're staging a heavyweight championship out in the middle of nowhere in Montana to try to uh, build up a, uh, a reputation for your area. The recap that I saw, saw that Dempsey, mo- or I'm sorry, that Gibbons mostly just clinches throughout the whole fight. And so the ref and it's, it's not judges at this point, I believe it's just uh, the referee awarding the victory and, uh, the referee awards the fight to Dempsey, like you said, um, there's like there's there's all sorts of financial issues with getting getting the money to put up the fight, trying to find backers and everything. Also, and we talked about this in one of our very first episodes that we did when we talked about the history of the heavyweight championship. This is during the time when Dempsey's really being hounded by these draft dodging accusations. And so prior to the fight in Montana, he's surrounded by veterans and these these groups that are going after him for ostensibly even though there's a lot more to the story than that for dodging the draft during world war one so there's controversy that follows the fight both you know both with dempsey and with the with rickard and with the financing piece of it i think rickard's involved yeah rickard's involved in this but it you know it ends up being an uneventful fight in the ring and so uh dempsey uh defends the title successfully for the second to last time in his career so the most um, significant fight of the year and really Dempsey's only other fight in 1923, but it's one that's definitely worth talking about, took place in a, a venue in a city where we're going to cover a lot of things uh, later on when we get to the baseball part. 
uh, the polo grounds in New York City, the finest edifice ever built to house sports. Uh, September 14th, 1923, the fight is Jack Dempsey against Luis Firpo. A, it was the first Latin American uh, to challenge for the world heavyweight title. It is a very notable fight. And I know you think I'm going to plant the joke, but I'll just play this straight up, which is if you've ever seen the movie Rocky, the first Rocky, when Mickey goes to convince Rocky that he needs a manager and Mickey is talking about how he knocked uh, and we had some debate about this. Uh, you and I did because it does look like in the script, the guy's last name is Russo. Mickey Burgess Meredith pronounces it like Russell. So it sounds like he says Russell, but I think in the script it is Russo. But Mickey says he knocked a, a, a fighter named Guinea Russo out of the ring that night. It's the same night that Furpo knocked Dempsey out of the ring. And that that got all the all the coverage because, well, because he was champ or because he had management. We can <laughs> discuss that. But long story short, so this fight takes place. And Furpo is considered one of the top heavyweights in the world. So unlike the last fight in Montana, he's seen like he's got a, a worthy challenger with an awesome nickname, El Toro de las Pampas, the wild bull of the Pampas. Um, so in the first round, uh, Dempsey knocks Furpo down seven times. Now, this is... While boxing still looks like boxing, some of the rules are different. There's a no official rule that when you knock somebody down, they're supposed to go to a neutral corner, but the referee is not supposed to let you stand over the guy and just knock him back down whenever he gets up. Um, so, so Dempsey was permitted to stand over the fallen Furpo and immediately knock him down again, as there was no rule about going to a neutral corner. The referee, Johnny Gallagher, was still supposed to prevent the fighter from scoring the knockdown by standing directly over his floored opponent. In the aftermath of the fight, Gallagher was suspended after an investigation and never refereed again. Two months after the fight, the New York Boxing Commission adopted the neutral corner rule. So that's the beginning of the that's the beginning of the controversy. And this is also needless to say a time where, you know, sometimes I watch boxing with people who don't really, you know, have seen boxing in movies or video games. And they say, oh, there's no three knockdown rule. And I say, because the, the rules will come up and say there's no three knockdown rule. And what I tell them is the fight is over long before a guy gets knocked down three times in boxing. That's now a hundred years ago, getting knocked down seven times in a round. If you kept getting up, didn't necessarily end the fight. Dempsey gets knocked out of the ring and he gets back into the ring at the count of nine. Now, according to the, you know, I, I don't know if people have studied the newsreel footage or live reporting or whatever. He is outside the ring for 17 seconds now, and I've seen this in a recent boxing match, you wouldn't think this is actually a rule, but if you get knocked out of the ring, you do have 20 seconds to get back in the ring. It's almost like wrestling with a count out. You are allowed to get back in the ring. The one caveat, and it was true now, just like it's true then, they're not allowed to help you. No corner man's allowed. To, it's just like you if you're knocked down in the ring and the, you know your corner man can't run into the ring and help you get up if you're knocked down in the ring. It's the same thing. So... He reaches the ring at a count of nine. It's actually been closer to 17 seconds. He's being helped into the ring. He gets nailed with a bunch of punches in a row. Comes back in the second round, knocks Furpo out. Uh, fight gets named the, the fight of the year. Gene Tunney, the famous fighter, um, gave an interview to Esquire later on in his career, later on in his life and said, the Dempsey Furpo fight was the most controversial in boxing history. He and, and you, I don't know if you saw this, but you know what Tony attributed for the problem for Furpo was? I did not. He didn't have a manager. Oh, jeez. <laughs> he said after Dempsey had been out of the ring 10 seconds, any manager would have been in there raising Furpo's hand and claiming the championship. Reporters at ringside helped him back in, a violation of the rules. Years later, Dempsey would say, I was down. And if it wasn't for the public throwing me back in there, I never would have gotten back into the ring. So obviously, Two controversial things in a fight that barely goes into the second round. Dempsey wins certainly a very controversial fight in a lot of ways, but one that 
you know, maybe not now, but I think even 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, it was still sort of in the public consciousness where people knew what happened in this fight. Yeah, and that was one of the things that would lead, if correct me if I'm wrong, to this requirement for the the guy to go to the neutral corner when he knocks somebody out or knocks somebody down, I should say. And that a few years later famously would come back to bite Dempsey when he fights Gene Tunney in 1927. Yeah, so this is really the sort of the last hurrah for Jack Dempsey. Mm -hmm. He doesn't fight again for three years. Let me let me just let me just fill in a couple things real quick before we get to that. Um, So uh, Dempsey later said in later years that as he's punching Furpo, even after having knocked him down a half dozen times, he said the lust to kill still kept burning in Furpo's eyes. That's what I was trying to put out. That's what Dempsey says about Furpo. And um, uh, a writer, uh, Haywood Brown is his name, who was a New York, uh, New York sports writer, did a lot of baseball stuff, too. He said, even when the bell rang, nothing clicked in Dempsey's mind. He kept on punching away at Furpo. This is in the first round. Um, The referee tugged at his arm and slapped him on the back and still he tried to hit the Argentinian. It was not until the crowd started to boo this punching after the bell that Dempsey shook his head, blinked and seemed to wake. Dempsey was this is something that was sort of later come to be understood. Dempsey was fighting while he was semi conscious, semi conscious for the rest of his days. He had no memory of being knocked outside of the ring. So Dempsey is, you know, he's, you know, probably suffered a pretty severe concussion before this fight is even over on a little bit more of a humorous note. um, By the way, there's a great book from about 20 some odd years ago that I remember reading right when it came out when I was still in high school and I'll put it in the show notes. It's by Roger Kahn, the famous New York sports writer who we actually talked about in the, in an immemorium episode a few years back. It's called a flame of pure fire, Jack Dempsey in the roaring twenties. And it's a great book and I'll put it in the show notes. Um, When Dempsey gets knocked out of the ring by Furpo, uh, this is a quote from another book. It says the polo grounds was in delirium. The infield benches toppled over and men scuffled Uh, among them. uh, A one specific observer who nearly gets into a fray with welterweight champion Mickey Walker. Do you know who almost gets into a fight with welterweight champion Mickey Walker? Who's that? Babe Ruth. Oh, I think I did have in that book, this book I have on the 23 baseball season. Mm-hmm. I think I do have that. I also wanted to point out earlier, like this was a quite a year for Furpo when he kind of became a legend after this fight in July, just about a week after Dempsey got done in Montana, Furpo fought Jess Willard in a fight that had to be moved to Jersey City so it could be fought outside in front of what was estimated to be the largest crowd at the time of close to 100,000. This Dempsey fight at the Polo Grounds had, I think they said, upward of 80,000 people there, which was much more than its capacity, even for normal boxing. They, you know, they added a bunch of temporary seating and obviously the seats on the on the the, the playing field, the baseball field. So, you know, obviously, an ultimately an unsuccessful run for the heavyweight championship, but really quite a year for him where he went from, you know, being a guy who I don't think was that well known at the beginning of the year. He fought. How many times did he fight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He fought at least nine times in 1923, by my count. Some of these venues he fought at Yankee Stadium. He fought at Madison Square Garden. He fought in Havana. He fought in Battle Creek, Michigan. He fought at Shy Park, the Polo Grounds. He was all over the place. So Furpo, he's been to Battle Creek. Furpo, <laughs> you beat I didn't me think to I it. Said that. You beat me to um, it. So, yeah, so both, you know, obviously Dempsey's legacy was already sealed by this time, but Furpo became kind of a legend, especially in his home of Argentina and and uh, really all of Latin America, because not only as a boxer, but as a heavyweight boxer. The one other opponent of Dempsey's that we should mention uh, from 1923 is an opponent that he doesn't fight, and that's Harry Willis, who is the... Mm-hmm. Considered by many, uh, including uh, Nat Fleischer in the Ring magazine, to um, to be the number one contender. The issue is that Harry Willis is black. And there's some issues, um, you know, that about whether or not Dempsey refuses to fight Willard. I'm sorry, to fight Willis. 
there are times when Dempsey says he will keep the color line. There are t- other times when he said he'd be glad to fight Willis. T- Tex Rickard, who's Dempsey's uh, promoter, who we had mentioned previously, one of the things that he's afraid of is that uh, if he were to try and schedule and promote a Dempsey Willis fight, that it would be a divisive promotion, sort of like the Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries fight had been about a decade Earlier, um, he said there would be a business risk of seeing the title pass from Dempsey to a black man. So that fight would never actually happen. Uh, Roger Kahn in his book does ask questions about um, whether Willis would have been a a worthy opponent for Dempsey. And so let me just uh, let me just pull that up here as well. Um Khan writes that, quote, facts suggest that Harry Willis would have proved to be nothing more than another quick Dempsey knockout. Willis was big, strong, awkward and not notably fast, the kind of heavyweight that Dempsey devoured. And Willis actually lost a bout to Dempsey's uh, sparring partner, Bill, Bill Tate. So, you know, whether or not Willis would have been a worthy opponent for Dempsey maybe remains to be seen. But then again, he fought a guy like Gibbons, who was maybe not a worthy opponent. Plus, as I think you're about to mention, Dempsey also goes three years now without fighting until 1926 when he loses the title. So he probably could have and should have found a time to give Harry Willis a shot, but he doesn't give Willis a shot. And in fact, from 23 to 26, he doesn't give anybody a shot. Yeah, so he fights. He doesn't fight again for three years, almost to the day. It's September 14th of 23 is when this the fight against Furpo takes place. He fights again on September 23rd of 1926 against Gene Tunney at Susquecentennial Stadium. Or sent, I, I never know how to pronounce it. It would eventually become JFK Stadium in, in Philadelphia. It was not named JFK Stadium in 1923 for 26 for reasons that ought to be obvious. Uh, he fights Gene Tunney, loses to Gene Tunney. Uh, doesn't fight again until July of 27, where he beats Jack Sharkey at Yankee Stadium, has a rematch with Tunney in September of 27 at Soldier Field. That's the famous long count fight. And that's the end of Jack Tunney's career at or Jack, excuse me, Jack. I didn't do that on purpose. I swear to God. Uh, that's the end of Jack Dempsey's career at 64, 6 and 9. You know, the interesting thing about Dempsey's career is he doesn't really have a big victory once he's champion i guess the carpentier fight is a big one and i mean furpo to a certain extent and i i don't claim to be a uh an expert on dempsey but for a guy who's considered one of the best of all time he beats jess willard for the title in 19 and then his five titles five championships are billy misk bill brennan george carpentier tommy gibbons and luis furpo he doesn't have even like a Lewis with Schmeling, which I guess that was when Lewis Schmeling, yeah, no, that was a Lewis title defense. Yeah, Lewis was champion in the Lewis Schmeling, the second Lewis Schmeling fight. There's just, yeah, he lost to him before he was the champion. And then, yeah, there's, I mean, Jack Johnson's got some, Ali does, even Marciano has a couple, you know, who was it? Um, uh, why am I Ezra Charles? I think it was was one of his big title defenses. Just, 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 there doesn't seem to be a really big Dempsey title defense that you can point to, but uh, maybe that's a conversation for another day. And if you want to hear more about Dempsey, his career, the heavyweight title, go back to, I think it was only like our fourth or fifth episode. Uh, Mm. We did two episodes on the history of the world heavyweight championship in boxing. So uh, check those out if you want more boxing. But the other thing that that's mentioned in, in both of the books that I looked at for research, Dempsey probably made more in one fight than Babe Ruth made in his whole career. So at the time, as we mentioned in that episode so long ago, being the heavyweight champion of the world was not only very prestigious, it was very lucrative. And if you think about that was in the days before there was any TV, before there was obviously any pay-per-view or or even that much radio of fights, it was, you know, live gate and your, you know, how much they could, the, the press would take a hold of it and, and things like that. But it wasn't, you know, to make that much money with those few avenues. And I know by then it was the twenties and the economy was, you know, really starting to pick up steam, but uh, 
really some impressive money made there for a uh, a fight that the only real way to see a guy fight back then was to be in the building for him to fight. Should we talk about a little bit of, uh, of football? Yes. You want to start with pro football or do you want to start with college football? Why don't we look at pro football first? Excellent. So I'll let you take the start of this, but so we're, we're talking about 1923. So it's the fourth season of the NFL. Um, was it just a one year? It was really called the APFA. Two. 1922 Two. is when it officially became the National Football League. So this is its second year known as the National Football League. And the, and the fourth year, no, you know, really is uh, as what you would consider the fourth year of the league, you know, just for sort of clarity, the Giants are not in the league yet. It would be two more years before the Giants joined the league. Um, we're still very much in the frontier era. The guys you, you see Curly Lambeau is still in charge with the pen. I know some of these guys were in charge for a long time, but Curly Lambeau is in charge of the Green Bay Packers. George Hallis in charge of the Chicago Bears. Um, Jim Thorpe with the Orang Indians traveling team. No real set schedule yet or anything like that. So still very primitive early days of the league. But it's starting to solidify a little bit. They're mm-hmm. starting to regular regularize the schedules a little bit. They're, you know, they're sort of moving in that direction. Thorpe is on this Oorang Indians team, which is probably the only professional sports team in history founded to promote a dog breeding and dog kennel company. The owner is a gentleman who owns dog kennels, uh, I believe, I believe in Ohio. Um, And he recruits Jim, Jim Thorpe to not only play on, but also coach this team. Thorpe, who's in, I think his late thirties by this point and has seen it, definitely seen his glory days pass him by. Thorpe had previously played, and Thorpe is also joined on the team by another hall of famer and uh, with the Oorang Indians team, guy, the guy by the name of Joe Guyon, who's also an early NFL Hall of Famer. His his nickname is actually Indian Joe Guyon, but the G-U-Y-O-N. The champions for 1923 for the second year in a row are the Canton Bulldogs, who play, uh, as you uh, might expect, in um, in the city of Canton, Ohio, town of Canton, Ohio, later to become the in addition to being the birthplace of the NFL in 1920, it also is the also is the current home since the early 60s of the Professional Football Hall of Fame. The 1923 Canton Bulldogs are coached by one of their starting ends, a Hall of Famer by the name of Guy Chamberlain. They've been in the league since 1920. They were 10 0 and 2. The year before this year, they are 11 0 and 1. Chamberlain is the coach. He had actually been recruited to the team a couple of years previously by by Jim Thorpe himself. The couple of other uh, Hall of Famers that they have on the team, two tackles uh, by the name of Pete Henry and um, actually three, uh, three, three future Hall of Fame tackles, uh, Pete Henry. Uh, Link Lyman and Fats Henry, all uh, all few. I, th- I think they're all on the team. Let me just uh, let me just double check that. Yeah, there's Chamberlain, there's Pete Henry, there's uh, there's Link Lyman, and who did I say the other uh, the other Hall of Famer was? Oh no, Fats Henry and Link Lyman. I'm sorry, same guys. Yeah, so three Hall of Famers: uh, Fats Henry and Link Lyman at tackle, and Chamberlain at end. About. Lyman, it is said, Lyman stood six foot two and weighed about 257. When he hit you, he hit you for good, and he didn't care who you were. He uh, Henry was shorter. He weighed 245. He was very active in the line. It was one of the finest punters of all time. A lot of people said that those two, and this is Chamberlain speaking, a lot of people said that they were responsible for our success, and they were right. The Canton Bulldogs win. Uh, they get four shutouts in their first four uh, games of the year, winning by scores of 17-0, 37-0, 30-0, 30-0 and then a shutout uh, in October of the Chicago Bears, uh, six to nothing at uh, what will one day become Wrigley Field. They win their next two games, giving up only a field goal. And then on November 11th, uh, with a record of six and zero, they go to Buffalo to play the Buffalo All-Americans, and they tie that game 
three to three on a muddy field. They trail three to zero until Chamberlain blocks a punt in the game's final minute to set up the tying drop kick field goal. I believe by Henry. I can double check. Yep, I believe uh, yep, by Fats Henry, future Hall of Famer. So they that they tie that game and then go on back on their streak of blowouts, forty-one nothing to over Urang and Jim Thorpe. They beat the Cleveland team with Cleveland Indians 46 to 10. And I believe that's the only touchdown they give up all year before going on to going on to shut out three more teams, including revenge uh, against Buffalo 14 to nothing on December 2nd. And they go 11 0 and one. We're still about 10 years from any sort of playoffs or championship here, but they go 11 0 and one to win the second straight uh, league championship for the team. Um, the second straight t- season without a loss led by those three hall of famers and the Canton Bulldogs are NFL champions once again. So after the season ends, they do play in, it's not an official postseason game, obviously, but they played the Frankfurt yellow jackets who were an independent team actually would join the team the next year, they called themselves the champions of the East. They were nine, one and two that year, although again, not in the NFL. So how the hell do you quantify that? I know they did play some NFL teams that year, but they were listed as, I mean, let's some of these teams they beat all Lancaster, which I mean is, is the elite Lancaster team. And the thing you got to remember about that back then, there's a lot of Amish people in Lancaster, but they weren't that far behind back then. <laughs> They're only like 50 years behind back then. Bethlehem Thomas AC, New Haven. They tied the Gilbert and Catamounts. They beat the Shenandoah Yellow Jackets. They beat the Coldale Big Green. Pottsville's an NFL team. They beat Rochester. They beat the New York Giants. I don't know what that means um, because the real Giants didn't exist yet. The Afrin, Akron Pros, the Buffalo All Americans, before they finally played Canton in a de facto championship game which the Canton Bulldogs win by a score of three to nothing. Canton gets a field goal from that same Pete Henry uh, towards the end of the game. And Canton gets to beat uh, the, you know, the best sort of independent team in the country as well. And, uh, and can declare themselves, you know, world champions or, or whatever you want to refer to it as. Just a little bit more uh, before we move off of this on Chamberlain. There's a book uh, by John Maximuk uh, called Pioneer Coaches of the NFL, where he talks about some of the the most successful coaches of the very early days of the NFL. He uh, and he talks uh, at the end of the book, he gives a little bit of a an analysis of sort of what the prototype of some of these of some of these coaches sort of who you could compare them to from a later era. So for instance, Steve Owen, who's later the coach of the giants, uh, they, they say you can compare him to guys like George Allen, uh, Jim Mora, John Harbaugh and Chuck Knox or Curly Lambeau. You can, can, uh, you could maybe compare him to Ali Sherman, Mike Shanahan or Hank Stram. And uh, with Guy Chamberlain, he says it's, it's kind of similar to Vince Lombardi. He's a, an emphasis on a few plays, thoroughly practiced training, conditioning, teamwork, organization, and a compressed period of extreme success. So a short coaching career with a lot of success. And so it's one of those things where we talk about in sports where you don't necessarily think of it beforehand, but once it's in place and everybody does it, you take it for granted. And this idea of having a team practice and meet a couple times a week and get together and condition and sort of perfect their plays. That wasn't really something that a lot of teams and a lot of coaches did. And Chamberlain is one of the first to do that. The other thing uh, that he did quite a bit would be, um, which something you definitely don't see for very long in professional football, which is handing off the ball to a tackle. So in 1922, Fats Henry ran the ball 15 times for 79 yards. In 1923, he and Lyman combined ran the ball eight times for 37 yards. And also, and I don't know what the specific rules are that that allowed for this, but um, uh, caught three passes for 109 yards and two scores, according to 
incomplete statistics. So even though they were only tackles on offense, those two those two tackles, Henry and Lyman, were uh, very important not only to the defense but to to the offense and to the you know the ball handling. So the year after that, the uh, Bulldogs are uh, I think bought up and they actually miss a year. Some of the players go are transferred over to the Cleveland Bulldogs. And but then a year later, the Canton Bulldogs are reborn and um, go on to. I don't think they don't they don't win another championship in 25. Now, they're they're decent. They're four and their league record is four and four. So, again, NFL in the 20s, very strange with teams and players moving around all the time. There is a lot of guys on the Sports History Network who are a lot more well versed in some of this really early NFL stuff than we are. But something you need to take away. This is the last year of this iteration of the Canton Bulldogs. Although some of the players end up going over to the, to the Cleveland Bulldogs for 1924. So what it looks like happened is the 19, the owner of the Canton of the Cleveland Indians bought the Canton team after the night between the 23 and 24 season, basically mothballed it according to Wikipedia took the team's name and their best players transferred it to his Cleveland team and went on to win a championship with them in 1924. And I guess ultimately, I don't know exactly what happened, but the, um, the, the Bulldogs, the Canton version of the Bulldogs were resurrected in time for the 25 season only lasted a few more years and then were, uh, were gone for good. Yes. Yeah, so finished 1923 season team moved north and i guess that's a little simplistic they didn't really move north the owner of the indians bought them and then took the name and the best players and they were technically just inactive for the 1924 season that's one of the ways you can tell that a sport is really starting to develop because you see it in the earlier baseball too once they let you not own more than one team Mm -hmm. (laughs) you you can tell they're finally coming up with some rules so that they don't let like that people always point to that 1899 cleveland spiders team that was like the worst team in baseball history and the reason they were the worst team in baseball history is because the guy who owned them owned another team in the league and just took all the best players and put them on that team so once they stop letting you do that you know the league is on its way well and the thing is that they they they're able to do that because they don't need you anymore you know they can say we'd rather have a team not in the league than a team owned by two different two teams owned by the same guy so they'd rather have a little bit more integrity than a second team to potentially draw some revenue yeah i think that's pretty accurate did you have anything else on pro football in 1923 no, I, 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 even in my research, I was able to find more, even about sort of more, um, you know, more seasons around it. There's just, there's not a lot there. I think in 25 is when you get one of those, uh, those AFL teams that we talked about in our or AFL leagues, I should say in, uh, one of our previous episodes, sort of a challenger league, mm. I, there really just wasn't out there um, much out there that I could find uh, other than maybe just you know some of the some of the consensus uh all pr- some of the guys who were around who are hall of famers in those years or the jim thorpe is an all pro um future hall of famer patty driscoll who's with the chicago cardinals uh is an all pro there are some guys who are around sort of these very early nfl players uh you know duke slater uh one of the first great black players in the nfl before they they draw the color line for about a decade and a half so there are some great players um in the league but even some of the guys like one i think we're going to talk about in a second here who you'd know is some of the future really sort of legends of even the early nfl aren't there so it is very much an early um an early league that's still getting its footing a little bit. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it's till the early thirties when the league is really established, even in its primitive, uh, even in its primitive form. Right. I mean, you know, know a lot more about this than I do, but well, and by then you have it sort of, you're still having some teams bobbing in and out, but it's not like this by the early thirties, there aren't eight or nine teams in Ohio. 
it's not yeah. it's not quite as catch as catch can. Plus, the on field product, I think, is getting a little better, too. By the 30s, you have the Giants, you have the team that would become the Lions, you have the team that would become the Eagles. I think you have the Steelers right around this time. So, mm-hmm. you, you know, the Bears are becoming the Bears under Hallis with Grange it and Nagurski. basically gets standardized like this is how many teams are in the league. This is how many games they play. This is how we determine who they play. Teams still would like pick up exhibition games and things like that. But like it was a league in the sense that there was a fixed schedule and teams. And with all of these leagues, it's not like they didn't know how to do it or it's not like there wasn't a model. That's what's always interesting to me. And I know probably a lot of it was just, you know, the, you know, the ability to find an audience. And with the Negro League team, uh, the Negro Leagues, it was, you know, there was you can add prejudice and racism into the whole thing, too. But all of these leagues that we're going to talk about in the pros, football, Negro League baseball, professional basketball, such as it was. It's not like there wasn't a model with the American and National Leagues of how to do organized sports with a schedule. You just need the money. Yeah, you just need the money. You need the fan base. You need to be able to to knock out the competition. But it, it was it was only the Wild West, basically in every sport, but white baseball. Yeah. So while we're on football, should we talk real quick about college football? Why don't we? All right. So 23 season. And obviously at this point, college football is much more established. It's considered much more respectable than pro football, but that doesn't mean it's, it's organized in a way we would recognize even 20 or 30 years later. There's still plenty of teams that claim national championships from the basically back then, if you either won a national championship or lost one game, you could at least have a semi-credible claim. You mean you if you were national- undefeated or lost one game? Yeah, what did I say? If you didn't win any games? You said if you know, you said if you won a national championship or lost one game. Oh, sorry. Basically, if you went undefeated, or even if you lost one game and you were especially uh feeling, you know, feeling very adventurous, you could just say we won the national championship and they could other people could say, no, you didn't, but there's really not there really wasn't a mechanism in place to say like to resolve those disputes. So two teams with the most credible claims in 23, you were Illinois and Michigan, uh, which is interesting because they're now both like Midwestern big 10 teams. They were both eight. Uh, no um, Illinois, the big, the name. And I, I think this is what you were alluding to before the name you'll recognize in Illinois was red Grange. Yes, this is Grange's sophomore year. This is during a time when freshmen are not eligible. And this is Grange's sophomore year with with Illinois. It is his first it is his first year playing. He scores nine touchdowns in his first four games uh, and ends up both Michigan and Illinois end up with eight and O records here. Let me see the. Um. Michigan is coached uh, by believe by fielding Yost, who is one of the considered one of the early great coaches in college football. Yeah, he was. Um, let me just take a look here. Yeah, he fielding Yost, who ends up coaching Michigan from uh, 1901 to 1923. And then again, from 25 to 26. I don't know what happens in in 24, but he. They are eight. No, as are Illinois and historically i don't know sort of who has you know who because a lot of times historians will go back and look at who they think the champion should have been in that year i don't know if there was anybody they'll uh, do that when we talk about college basketball they'll that's that's how this was done this year i'll see if i can find any 1923 retroactive national champion so i'm looking here there's something called the um so illinois outscored opponents 136 to 20 both were in the big 10 but they didn't play each other which i guess is is interesting and it's funny here because i mean they probably with eight games they probably managed to play you know a decent number yeah so Illinois five and zero in conference, Michigan four and zero in conference. So they're basically playing half of their games against the um, against the conference. the The Billingsley report, 
which is a college football rating system uh, that was developed in the 60s. And they've gone retroactively to award. Award national championships, they give it to Michigan, but Illinois, um, Illinois has a, has a little bit of a claim here. I'm looking at a footnote here on Wikipedia in games against common opponents, Michigan won by a total of 32 points, whereas Illinois won by a total of 22 points. So it is really, really close. And much like the pros, this is a time when the Midwest, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois is really dominating college football. So it seems like more of the retroactive ones have given it to Illinois than um, than Michigan, but it also doesn't seem like it's a runaway thing. And I mean, there's really no, I think at that point you just go to which team had a guy alive the longest. (laughs) Well, and also you look back, let me look and see here. And again, you know, this is, it's fun to do these sometimes because, you know, the college football is not necessarily our our area of expertise anyway. And then when we get into college football, literally from 100 years ago, it is really not our area of expertise. Let me look at the Michigan team from 23 and see if there's anybody on the roster that I really would would recognize as a future. Yeah, I got to say, there's not a single guy here that um that i would recognize um from this 1923 team but you would only recognize them based on what they did in professional football which wasn't really an automatic back then Uh, yeah i mean not necessarily i would recognize maybe you know some of the guys like from the from the four horsemen in Notre dame or that type of thing your point is a fair one but i don't know if it's entirely the case that i that I wouldn't recognize these guys. The only guy I really recognize from uh, from the from the Illinois team is is uh, is Red Grange. So I do wonder if maybe the Illinois team has stayed in the public eye a little bit more historically because of the fact that it was Red Grange on the team. Let's just take another quick look here and see who who was an All American in those year in that year. Um, yeah, as far as guys who really received a lot of all of um of Hall of Fame or I'm sorry of of All American consideration, the only guy who who I really the only other one other than Red Grange that I recognize is uh uh Century Milstead. I don't even know why I recognize that name other than the fact that he was a a center on the the Giants uh, on their first ever championship team in. 1920 or a tackle i should say not a center a tackle on the giants in their early 19 on their 1927 their first ever championship team so sort of like in the pros not a lot of names other than grange that are really remembered by by history uh did you have anything else on college football before if, if not before before we ended i just wanted to to read something real quick so we're in an era there's only one bowl game it's the rose bowl 1924 it's or it's technically the 24 Rose Bowl because even back then it was played, you know, I think on probably on New Year. It was played on New Year's Day. The game was Washington against Navy. Uh, Navy ended up winning. Uh, did Navy win? I think they won. Navy won. Oh, it was a 14 to 14 tie. Excuse me. So the one bowl game of the year ended in a tie. Uh, for Navy and Washington a few weeks before that army and Navy with a zero zero tie at the polo grounds. And just looking at the army is interesting because all of our, all, all of army's home games were played at uh, the plain in West point, which is just basically a big open field. And uh, the reason I was interested in that is because the next year, 1924 was when Mikey stadium opened uh still their current stadium today obviously with some renovations but yeah so red grange is really the first great football college for any football really maybe with the exception of thorpe but really the first great college football superstar and i just want to read his scouting report from this era uh the scouting scout says Illinois seems to be a one-man a one man team with everything built around Grange. 
During the first half, it was the feats of Grange, which were directly responsible for responsible for Illinois scores. After Grange was taken out, Illinois seemed to weaken and they were all held almost nip and tuck by Northwestern. Grange, of course, is a remarkable player on his runs around defensive end and tackle. He has led almost a yard by center. He runs from five or six yards back and prefers to go around. Not once did I see him cut back when forced in. He would pass the line of scrimmage and would steer, still bear outwardly. He faints very well, dodging either in or out, but prefers to dodge so he can. Uh, so he finally can use his left arm as a stiff arm. And then another scout says, um, Grange appeared to be a whiz. He's what I call a knifer. That is, he goes in a straight line and never cuts back, but drives and tries to knife out using his speed to outrun the defensive men coming up to meet him. So a little bit of what they were saying contemporaneously about the great Red Grange. And Grange would go on to be one of the earlier high profile football players um to go pro i mean played with the bears for a year i didn't realize he left the bears for two years and played with the new york yankees and then went back to the to the bears from 29 to 34 the story i've always heard on the history of the giants dvd was in 25 after his because tim mara tried to sign red grange uh, to the bear to the giants after their first season but he had already committed to the bears but he convinced uh, the Bears, they came and played an exhibition game with the Yankees at the end of the season at the Polo Grounds, and the Yankees were able to make so much on that, or excuse me, the Giants, rather, I'm sorry, I keep saying the Yankees. The Giants were able to make so much on that game that it kept them like financially solvent through the offseason because it was not a real money-making prospect for them in the first year. And that New York Yankees team was part of the first American Football League that we talked about uh, in our uh, in our episode. The guy, the, team, the league that was founded by... Uh, by Babe Ruth's trainer, whose name escapes me at the moment, that was a, a competition, one of the fir- probably the first professional league that competed directly with the NFL for at least mm. a couple of years. Yeah, where Grange went after the the one year with the Bears and then yeah, went back. And before he went back, back, then you had to be a player of Red Grange's caliber to get away with doing that and still be allowed to come back, especially with a guy like George Hallis. All right, so. We've done football, we've done uh, boxing, and we want to close it out with baseball. But this is one of those times where we do uh, one of our other favorite things where we sort of get into some of the other things in sports that we uh, that we saw. Um, where should we go first? There's no Olympics this year, which is usually which there was in in some of these other years that we've done. And that's been a, an easy thing to touch on. but. What else did you find that was notable from the world of sports in 1923? All right. So tennis, uh, Wimbledon was won by an American, Bill Johnston. The U.S., not yet open, but the U.S. championship uh, was won by B- Bill Tilden, which would eventually become the U.S. Open. And Tilden is considered sort of one of the mm. great sports stars mm. of the 1920s, along with Ruth and Dempsey and Grange and a couple others when you hear a name of sort of the great sports stars, twenties are sort of the first era of superstar mass media sports figures. And Tilden gets put in that list with guys like Grange and Dempsey and Ruth. Yep. And this was also back when uh, the U S championship was strictly an amateur thing. That's why it wasn't considered the open Yet until then, I believe held out as an amateur until the very late twenties before he he really just couldn't make enough money as an amateur and became a professional. But he wins the U.S. Open in that year. Um, wins it both in singles and doubles. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't have the doubles. I just had the singles. Doubles with um, a partner, obviously. Yes, obviously. Uh, in golf. The U.S. Open, this is pre-Masters. The U.S. Open is won by Bobby Jones. It's his first major championship. It was also a one, and I guess back then they played Wednesday to Saturday instead of Thursday to Sunday. But he went to a 18-hole playoff. The, it was Oh, by the way, the, um, the U.S. Open was held at Germantown Cricket Club. That's the tennis one. It was mm-hmm. played at, held at Germantown Cricket Club in... Um, 
in uh, Germantown, Philadelphia, which is like a mile from where my college is, where I went to school at LaSalle. And I looked it up and it's still there. I would not have thought that, but it is still there. The Germantown Cricket Club. Um, the U.S. Open was at Inwood Country Club on Long Island. And I guess back then they went Wednesday to Saturday. But since it was tied, just like today, they went to an 18-hole playoff on that Sunday. And they uh, Bobby Jones outlasted Crookshank to win his first of four U.S. Open titles, which is still a record uh, that he has today tied with Willie Anderson, Ben Hogan, and Jack Nicholas. He outlasts Bobby Crookshank, who is five foot two inches and is known as either we Bobby Crookshank or the we Scott. And you're right in just like and the U.S. Open still does that today. They do that full 18 hole playoff if there's a tie after four days. And it's funny here. The chart says playoff. And it's got two lines. It says Bobby Jones with an A in parentheses. Bobby Crookshank scores Jones 76 Crookshank 78 two par plus four for Jones plus six for Crookshank money. Crookshank 500 Jones zero. Because he was an amateur, so he didn't get any money. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, so two big names there. And, and I, you know, that's where I kind of looked for to, to come up with uh, with names for those, you know, who, who if either of them won any major tournaments in their respective sports, which they did in horse racing. And I just looked up the U.S. Triple Crown races, um, a horse named Zev won both the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont, but Vigil won the Preakness. So you did have still, you know, I believe the first modern Triple Crown winner was in 1919. So it wasn't like it hadn't happened yet or that it wasn't a thing yet. Yeah, I'm almost positive of that, that the, the first, what they consider the first Triple Crown was in 1919. But uh, the three races, Zev wins two of them, but not the middle one in Auto racing, and this is an interesting one. I don't know if you saw any of this. The Indy 500. I, I did, and uh, I want to get into this a little bit. All right, all right. So <laughs> the Indy 500 is won by uh, the 1923 Indy 500, which was held on May 30th, 1923. First, at the beginning, there was controversy about the Indy 500 being held on Memorial Day because the uh, Indiana State Legislature had passed a bill prohibiting such events on Memorial Day. And the quote here is veterans groups and proponents of the measure led by Senator Robert Moorhead were displeased with the way the holiday had become a day for games, races and revelry instead of a day of memory and tears. The American Legion opposed the bill. Eventually, the governor was basically forced to say he thought it was unconstitutional and veto it. I guess a big issue was back then people didn't really have Saturdays off. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't just move it to a Saturday, at least most of the people who were going to come to a race. So they ultimately sidestepped that issue uh, in the race. Tommy Milton, who is a he's on the pole position. He is replaced. Do you have do you have more details on this or can I just mention it real quick? Go ahead. So so he is replaced between miles between laps 103 and 105, he's relieved by a guy named Howdy Wilcox, who had won the race two years earlier. Wilcox had been in the race earlier, but was out very fairly quickly because of an issue with his clutch. It looks like his his car was out after 60 laps or so. So because of a, a you know mechanical failure. So he comes in because Milton, I think he had burns on his hands or something along those lines and had to That's be bandaged. Right. So, you know, they always say these days, and I don't think they let you do this anymore, but they always say in auto racing, now it's the car that qualifies. It's not the racer. They refer to it as the racer because that's what people can identify with, but you qualify the car, not the racer. So, I guess back then, you know, now they wouldn't let a guy who was already in the race come in and, and race to, in this, but he did for a while and then, you know, left again. And uh, and Milton came in and won the race in five hours, 29 minutes, 50 seconds. Uh, Howdy Wilcox, actually, um, after helping Milton win the Indianapolis 500, 
only lives a few more months. He loses his right life in September 1923 in a race at the Altoona Raceway in Pennsylvania. So only uh, only lives a few more a few more months after effectively serving, I guess, is what you would almost call like a, a relief pitcher uh, for mm-hmm. Tommy Milton uh, to win the 1923 Indy 500. This is Milton's second winner. Uh, second win. He had also won it in. 1921 it looks to me like wilcox had won in wilcox had won in 19 so not only had did wilcox help win this one he had previously won four years earlier in 1919 this is also the first year of the indy 500 in which riding mechanics are optional damn it yeah i was gonna say that yeah so there were up until and there had been an era like i don't think at first there was riding mechanics then they came into vogue for a while and then after in 1923, they were mandatory. By 1924, they were made optional. Or excuse me, 1922, they were mandatory. By 1923, they were made optional. So the only team, only one team utilized one. Let's see, Indianapolis 500 winning riding. Yeah. So the riding mechanics started in 1912, it looks like. So it wasn't that the, the first Indy 500, I believe, was 19. 19- 11. So there wasn't one in 1911. And then after that, for 10 years, they were uh, were standard and then, you know, very short time frame before they fell out of favor again. And I'd imagine they took a few years off of the Indy 500 uh, for World War One, at least two, probably. Yeah, you would think. Um, so and just one other thing on the auto racing, I wanted to mention this is kind of, you know, obviously they took them five and a half hours to go 500 miles, which for the time was you know pretty incredible. When you think about the year we're talking about the last person who finished, finished in six hours and 41 minutes. So if you think about the fact that they just kept driving around for an hour after the race was over, uh, like nowadays, nowadays the last guy who finishes finishes 18 seconds behind the guy who wins or whatever. But like, could you imagine that just like while the rest of them are just still racing for an hour? Hey, there wasn't there weren't as many entertainment options then. People wanted to stick around. Well, that's very true. Um, I also I have stuff on college basketball, pro basketball, and hockey, which I figured we'd get to in a minute. Did you have anything else before we got to that? Did you have anything else before we got to that? Yes, I did. All right, yes, let's hear I, about 1923 in wrestling. So we are in the very early days of wrestling. The 1948 is when the National Wrestling Alliance Championship came into to being. Prior to that, the sort of considered the primitive ancestor of that was the National Wrestling Association Championship. That didn't even come into being until 1930. So we are dealing with the era of what you would call the Gold Dust Trio, one of whom was Toots Mont. And essentially, wrestling at the time, even though it was a sport that was largely not on the level the real uh what they call in wrestling these days screw jobs took place behind the scenes where basically a different promoter would try to get his guy to wrestle another guy and then really beat him in the ring and take the title and claim him as the world championship which is the era we're in kind of the wild wild west sometimes literally the wild wild west <laughs> what we were what we were in here was the era of ed Strangler Lewis was the world champion in 1923, or at least the most largely recognized champion in 1923. Um, I'll just go through a couple of crowds that he wrestled in front of. Um, In February in Kansas City, he wrestled in front of 10,000. Also in February in St. Louis in front of 10,000. He wrestled Jim Londus, who was the big star, you know, 15 years later, 10 years later in the 30s. So um, I won't go into all this, but Ed Strangler Lewis sort of traveling around largely in the Midwest, places like Chicago, uh, Minnesota, Kansas City, Omaha, places like that. Um, But he was the uh, the biggest star in the country and wrestled, you know, every every month or so would have a have a big bout. And these were. These were fights that looked a lot like guys, two guys really wrestling. And to an extent, it was usually they agreed on how the outcome would go, the finish. But guys like Ed Strangler Lewis and other guys 
had to be legitimately good, tough people and good amateur wrestlers in case somebody decided to go off the script with them. They would be able to take care of themselves uh, to use the terminology in the ring. So that's all I had on wrestling in 1923. And I didn't do much research on the hockey. So why don't you uh, why don't you go go ahead and give us a little bit on that, too? So we're in the sixth season of the NHL. And for anybody who tries to talk to you about the original six, they don't know what they're talking about because at one point there was four, at one point there was eight. It went back down to six. The era we're in right now in hockey is the four team era in the NHL. The Stanley cup is in a, a very, so the four teams in the NHL are all Canadian Ottawa, the Ottawa senators who, not the uninterrupted current Ottawa Senators, the Montreal Canadiens, the Toronto St. Patrick's and the Hamilton Tigers. They played a 24 game season in which Ottawa came out the number one team, just barely edging out Montreal by a single point and actually only edging out the Toronto St. Patrick's by two points. They all just did a lot of beating up on Hamilton that year. The era we're in for the Stanley cup for people who originally the Stanley cup was a, was a challenge cup, sort of like a boxing title or a wrestling title where you played against a team who was challenging you. Then for a while, eventually by 1926, it became exclusive to the NHL. But with the era we're in now, there are still a few leagues who are, allowed to contend for the Stanley cup in a tournament at the end of the year. So the three leagues, you have the NHL, who I just mentioned, you have the Pacific coast hockey association with just three teams in it, which is the, by this point, they only have three teams in it, the Seattle metropolitans, the Vancouver Maroons and the Victoria Cougars. And then you also have the Western Canada Hockey League, the teams in Western Canada in the 1922-23 season, Edmonton Eskimos are the teams that are the team that wins it. I believe there's only three teams or three or four teams in the league. I thought I had this written down, but the Calgary Tigers, the Edmonton Eskimos, really not. Oh, here, really, here we go. Um, the Regina Capitals, the Edmonton Eskimos, the Calgary Tigers, the Saskatoon Crescents. And I guess that would be it. So they all, you know, three and four team leagues. And I guess the one of the leagues, I forget which one, not what, not the NHL, but one of the other two leagues was finally allowed back into the playoffs because they gave up on the, they gave up on, they had played seven on seven in previous seasons, Mm -hmm. which obviously was a different brand of hockey. And when they finally agreed to go back to the standard five on five with a goalie. So six on six, the playoffs continue, you know, were a lot, they were all playing under the same rules. So they played a, a tiered playoff system where the WCHL champions received the buy. So Ottawa beat um, first, they beat Vancouver in a four game series, which they won three to one. And then they played Edmonton in the Stanley Cup finals, which they swept two to nothing. So the playoff scoring leader, by the way, that year for the Ottawa Senators, Punch Broadbent. Ah, good old Punch Broadbent. (laughs) Yes. So, um, you know, not a ton on that. That would last another couple of years. By 26, you have the Rangers coming into the NHL. The NHL basically even though they don't fully control the Stanley cup yet, they essentially refuse to put the cup on the line against any other team, but we're still in this sort of transition era where it's moving between being a straight, like challenge thing to what would eventually just become the NHL, uh, just become the NHL season trophy. Yeah. That they're like you said, it's definitely, they're in a transition time at this, at this period. And there's still yep. not that there ever isn't, but the, the Canadian flavor is still very much important at this time. The, the only team I listed there who played in the United States was Seattle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do we want to move on to basketball? Yeah, let's let's do basketball. You want to start with pro basketball such as it is? 
why don't we start with college basketball? And I have to say, okay. it, I really had a lot of fun. I found a lot of fun basketball stuff. And I want to start by reading a few paragraphs from this book by a gentleman by the name of Alexander Wayand uh, called The Cavalcade of Basketball, which is a history of basketball. And it was written in 1960. I have to be honest. I have no idea how I ended, how I got this book. I think I got it a few <laughs> years ago. I don't remember where I got it at a used bookstore, may, maybe in Cooperstown or maybe at the, the used bookstore in Brattle Books that I love in Boston. I don't know how I got this book, but it actually has a little recap of every season going back to the to the 1800s. And just to give you an idea, there is most of the book is college basketball. There is one chapter at the end on the pro game. And there's a chapter here on women's basketball. There's also a chapter here on a year by year recap of the AAU championships going back to sometime <laughs> in the early 1900s. So the history of basketball in 1960 was very different than what the history of basketball would be, frankly, even 10 to 12 years later. Anyway, here's what Mr. Wayan says about and it's, it's a few paragraphs long, but but bear with me. This is what he says about the, the college basketball season of 1922-1923. When the brass at West Point grew tired of being beaten by Navy at basketball, they engaged the services of Harry A. Fisher, former Columbia Wizard. With him came victory. Now in his second season in the, quote, rock-bound highlands of the Hudson, Mr. Fisher took Army to the top of the collegiate basketball world with a perfect record. The 17 games won enabled the cadets to extend their winning streak to 31. The team intact from the previous season downed Navy along with Columbia, Springfield, Pittsburgh, Colgate, Connecticut Aggies, Swarthmore, New York University, and others. Johnny Ruzma from a Passaic High School, quote, Wonder Five, played in only nine games, but led the team in scoring with 192 points. He got 17 against Navy. The other members of the team were Captain Clement DeBesis, master of the tip-off and backboards, Leo Vishulis, brilliant floor player and feeder, William Forbes, competent running guard, and William Wood, dependable in the backcourt. Fog Allen had another tremendous team at Kansas, which won 17 and lost only to the Kansas City Athletic Club. The Jayhawkers took the Mrs. took the Missouri Valley Conference title with 16 straight victories, and in addition, downed Creighton, champion of the North Central Conference. All of the players were good shots, but the strength of the team lay primarily in its defense, which revolved around two extraordinary guards, Captain Paul Endicott and Charles T. Black. The former was elected to the Helms Hall of Fame. John Wolfe, the veteran center, continued his fine play of the previous season. Missouri lost the only two games to all lost, lost only the two games to Kansas and won 14. The tiger captain, Arthur Browning led the conference in scoring with 237 points in the 14 games in which he engaged Franklin college playing mostly state rivals was unbeaten in 17 games and took a pair from Butler which turned in a 16 and three season record after defeating such named teams as Wisconsin, Illinois, Purdue, Chicago, Notre Dame, Wabash, and DePaul. Marquette and DePaul also compiled outstanding records. Iowa and Wisconsin, which did not meet on the court, each lost one league game and tied for the Western Conference crown. Jack Funk of Iowa topped the circuit scorers with 143 points in 12 games, a remarkable performance was turned in by Gus Nikos of Indiana, who scored 21 points in the team's 23 and 21, 23 to 21 victory over Iowa. Another cl clear, clever feat was the shooting of 15 out of a possible 17 free throws by Harrison Barnes of Chicago in a close victory over Purdue. Not to be compared with uh, confused with the Harrison Barnes of what, <laughs> 90 years later. Uh, one more paragraph here. Three powerful Eastern teams, each lost but once. Springfield, with 15 wins, was beaten by Army. Penn State failed only against Cornell in 14 starts. And City College of New York divided a series with Syracuse to bring its victories to an even dozen. 
Joe Fogarty brought Yale from the 1922 cellar to the championship of the Eastern League. Alan Blackmer of Williams led the Eastern scorers with 326 points in 15 games. North Carolina won 15 consecutive victories, but then flopped in the Southern Intercollegiate Championship Tournament, which was won by Mississippi A&M. Washington College in Maryland won 21 out of 23 games. Creighton became the first champion of the North Central Conference. Texas A&M won the Southwest Conference crown for the fourth consecutive year. Well, Philip Payton of Texas, in leading the point makers for the third time, raised the conference record to 182 points in 18 games. Colorado College was best in the Rocky Mountain Conference and Idaho in both the Pacific Coast and Northwest Conferences. So I don't know. I just felt like that was such a succinct summary of a college basketball season that it, it bared reading. I don't know what where you want to take this, but to me in reading this, Kansas was really the story here. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the stories about it. I guess they do have actually banners up for their national championships of 1922 and 23, because as you were going through that, I was looking at some of the um, articles where people have questioned. There's an article from the Columbia Missouri, which says what constitutes a basketball championship? Don't ask Kansas, which is from 10 years ago, I guess a little salty about them considering themselves national champions from that year, just because the Helms foundation years later considered them national champions. But do you know you anything know, I, about this Helms foundation? So in 19, I have this here and I've heard of it before just from LaSalle's history. But so what I have here is it says in 1939, a group of so-called expert, and this is going to be a little editorializing, but a group of so-called experts led by Bill Schroeder got together and voted for who had won the championship each year since 1901. The group called the Helms Athletic Foundation retroactively named Kansas the final champion for 1922 and 1923. And then they asked a guy who played on the team 10 years ago what he thought about it, like he was going to have any opinion. Um, so, but, um, so, I guess, and I feel like I've heard the Helms Athletic Foundation with something to do with LaSalle, to be honest, like in um, in uh, a, an All-American selection or something like that. And what they basically did was sometime in the 40s, went back and retroactively named not only national championships, but also player of the year. Yeah, maybe that's where I'm getting it from. So here's the deal with that. It's not like another team got considered national champion and they went in and overrode that 20 years later. They're the only ones who did it. And uh, yeah, some of these schools counting, you know, they talk about that with football where they count these national championships and it's like a little spurious. But like, I also don't like the theory of like nothing that happened in sports mattered before, you know, the NFL is guilty of it with the Super Bowl. And there's, you know, plenty of footage of things before 1967, the 1966 season. Yeah, it's hard to determine this. And it was made 20 years later. But like, I don't know. I like that. It's apparently the Kansas team, the Jayhawks wore throwback inspired uniforms last year. I guess they flipped the color because like the shorts were black and the jerseys were white. And then real the real team, it was flipped or something. But like, I like that they, you know, at least acknowledged that aspect of it. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's it's a little bit subjective, but, you know, those seasons were played and I have no problem with. And it's also it's not like the Helms Athletic Foundation got together in 1997 and did it. They did it 20 years later. Yeah, they probably talked to some people even going back to the turn of the century who had mm -hmm. some level of experience with it. Mm -hmm. The Kansas team is 17 and one. They are 16 and 0 in, I guess, what you'd consider conference play. Their only loss is to the is a 27 to 23 loss to the Kansas City Athletic Club, which I do not believe is a college. I believe that's sort of just an amateur athletic society. But that is their Sounds only like it. that is their only loss of the whole season. They have some interesting guys uh, on the roster. And then I want to talk a little bit about their coach, too. They uh, they're led by their backcourt, uh, which is Paul Endicott and Charlie T. Black Endicott, who is named by the same Helms Foundation to be the 
1922-1923 uh, player of the year. His jersey is retired at Kansas, and he is a member of the uh, the Naismith Hall of Fame, the, you know, the, the Basketball Hall of Fame as we know it. The other guard is a gentleman by the name of Charlie T. Black, who is not in the Hall of Fame, but he actually is named by the the um the Helms Foundation as the player of the year the following year, uh 1923, uh 24. He goes on to do a little bit of coaching at the University of Nebraska. He actually there's another Char- Charles Black who plays guard for Kansas. Uh I'm actually sorry, he's more of a front court player. Charles B. Black, who plays for Kansas in the 1940s, not the same guy. He this is Charlie T. Black. So they have by the player of the year for both 1923 and 1924 in the starting backcourt of this Kansas Jayhawks team. They also have on the roster Adolf Rupp, who is Mm -hmm. goes on to be the long time head coach of uh, Kentucky from 1930 to 1972 and wins, uh, wins four NCAA titles, uh, you know, seven SEC championships. Um, So, and then, you know, he's, he's also well known for, for sort of keeping his team segregated for, for a while longer than, uh, than a lot of other teams do. So that's, uh, that's maybe a little bit of a, a, you know, a negative in, on his legacy, but still one of the all time great college coaches of all time, Adolph Rupp. And you sort of see in basketball, the line because Rupp and and maybe we'll talk about this in a second. We'll get to this in a second, maybe, but Adolph Rupp is also on the team and he's playing for this legendary coach in (laughs) fog. Allen, who is maybe the first great basketball coach, college basketball coach of all time. And uh, when you think about it, Adolph Rupp and fog Allen both have arenas named after them. Yep. Adolph Rupp's Kentucky is Rupp Arena and Kansas is the Fog Allen Fieldhouse. And those are two of the blue blood programs in the history of, uh, you know, in the history of college basketball. So. So Fog Allen had been at Kansas uh, in the early part of the 19, uh, 1900s, 1907 to 1909. He then spent some time doing some other things, coaching some other places and also um attending uh, attending medical school. He was an, an osteopathic physician. He returns to Kansas in 1919 and uh, is there all the way until 1956. One of the thing that's interesting to me is that in 1907, when he's first named, do you know this? Did you see this story? Well, I've, I've heard this in, in the context of sort of the lineage, but you so, go ahead. When he's first named head coach of Kansas, he has a, a friend of his, a, a friend and mentor of his, say to him, uh, Fog, basketball is just a game that people play. It's not something that needs a coach. Which I guess is kind of a bummer for your friend to say to you anyway when you've just gotten a job. But his, uh, the guy saying this is James Naismith, who had invented <laughs> basketball about 18 years previous. So, Nonetheless, uh, Allen takes the job, goes on to uh, to a Hall of Fame career. And uh, in addition to the two retroactive Helms Foundation uh, championships, he also wins the NCAA tournament in 1952. So he he also becomes one of the all time greats, even if uh, even if James Naismith didn't think that it was uh, a worthy position to be coaching a college basketball team in the early part of the 20th century. Well, and didn't. Didn't Rupp, who was he the mentor of? Because I, I was it Dean Smith. So the one that that comes immediately to mind to me is that Rupp coached Pat Riley. OK, because I, I remember hearing that there's like this through line with one of the more modern guys where it's like he co-played under Rupp. Rupp played under Fog Allen and Fog Allen played under James Naismith. So so Dean Smith played at Kansas Mm -hmm. 49 to 453, which was sort of the last. Well, so, so, so you could also take it in the direction you could go either with Smith or with Rupp from Foggy. Oh, okay. But I think it was Smith. I heard it in the context of, and then Dean Smith coached, you know, Mm -hmm. Larry Brown and 
Roy Williams and he was a mentor to those guys. So yeah, you don't have to go far from guys who either are still coaching or were coaching very recently to get all the way back to, to D, to James Naismith in the 1890s. James Naismith coaching is still hilarious to me because like if guys are beating him, shouldn't he just be like, Nope, that's, you're not allowed to do that. Like, <laughs> So do you have anything else on the college basketball season? No, it's really about Kansas. It's, it's one of those things where, as I was reading, it really made me want to learn more about. And I want to do some of this on the sh- on the podcast in the coming years. We won't overdose on it, but I want to talk about some of the really very early years of some of these leagues and teams. So, like, I'd love to talk about, like, you know. The, you know, Fog Allen's teams of the 20s, you know, just to really kind of do a deep dive into stuff that you just don't hear a lot about. So it made me want to learn more about that and maybe maybe do some episodes on that type of thing also. But, yeah, interesting story. And uh, pro basketball, I thought, was interesting uh, as well in that time period. Yeah, so we're obviously we're several decades pre um, the NBA, the BAA, whatever. You're almost in a an area where there's multiple sort of, if we're being honest, very small time leagues. And then there's a couple of stories not related to teams that are in any leagues that are interested, interesting um, on pro basketball encyclopedia. So you have the Eastern basketball league, you have the New York state basketball league, the interstate basketball league. Uh, there was a Philadelphia league that came up Um so really a bunch of different teams. I wrote down some of the champions, the teams like the Patterson Legionnaires, the Kingston Colonials, which is Kingston just north of Poughkeepsie. So a l- lot of different things going on here. W- where do you want to go with the 23 uh, with pro basketball in 1923? To me, the most interesting thing was the original Celtics. Yeah. And that was one of the things I had written down. So you also had this team, the original Celtics, which it's, that was what they were called too. It wasn't just like people refer to them as the original Celtics now to, you know, to, to differentiate them from the modern day Boston Celtics. They referred to themselves as the original Celtics, which was in itself a dig at the prior version of the Celtics, which was what the New York Celtics. Mm-hmm. That sounds right. Yeah. So. Yeah, the New York, the original Celtics were kind of a barnstorming team, although, as I'm sure we're going to talk about, they found a way to dip in and out of a few leagues at different times. Yeah, in this league, they play in both the in this season, in the 22-23 season, they play in both the Eastern League and the Metropolitan League. I think they actually, if I remember what I read correctly, they actually played as the they take over the Atlantic city team in the mm-hmm. Eastern league, win five or six games. And then the league folds. And then they later go to the metropolitan league where they go 12. Oh, they're the champions of the first half of the season. But then sort of like you see with there's, there's actually an interesting parallel here with Negro league teams. Cause it was the same type of thing where these teams would compete in these leagues. They would dominate but then they'd soon realize that we can make more money just barnstorming and taking our team on the road. And that was what happened with the original Celtics. They ended up going on the road and later on, later in the twenties, they complete and compete in some more, uh, in some more leagues. But in this particular year, they complete and compete, I should say in two different leagues, play 18 games and go 17 and one. Most of their home games are in New York city. It looks like they, in late November, it says they agreed to represent the Atlantic Atlantic City in the EBL, won five of their first six, but they weren't drawing enough to support the guarantee that they were looking for. So the league was they pulled out of the league because they weren't getting the money they felt they were promised, um, which you know really didn't help the league any. But yeah, these teams were able to, and we're gonna talk, I'll talk about another barnstorming team in a minute, but these teams were more powerful than any league they were gonna be in. And it wasn't like they were getting paid for being in the league or winning championships, they were getting paid basically on what they drew. So it was better for them to sort of call their own shots. Some of the players that were on this team, a guy by the name of John Beckman, who was known as the Babe Ruth of basketball. He was one of the premier uh, gate attractions. He was only, he's in, he's in the hall of fame. He was only uh, five feet, 10 inches. Um, He became one of the team's leading scorers. Um, 
Another guy uh, who also I actually saw both of these guys referred to as the Babe Ruth of basketball was a gentleman by the name of Horse Haggerty, who uh, grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. He was a bigger guy. He was 6'4", 220 pounds. He spent uh, 17 years as one of the most popular barnstorming um, uh, players in the country. He um, is a rough player who drew many protests from opposing teams to his physical style of play. Both of these guys are with the Celtics in the 22 23 season. Another player on the Celtics teams uh, on the Celtics team is Nat Holman, who uh, is in the Hall of Fame as a coach Uh, later goes on to be the coach of the championship teams, uh, these championship uh, and scandal plague teams at CCNY uh, City College of New York in 1950. And also, he's not there yet. Uh, he, he doesn't join the team for uh, t- until uh, the 23-24 season is Joe Lapchick, who is uh, later goes on to coach St. John's uh, for a, a two stints at St. John's uh, in the 30s and 40s, and then again in the 50s and 60s. And also from 47 to 40, 56, Joe Lapchick is the head coach of the Knicks and brings them to three consecutive finals, all of which they unfortunately lose. But another guy who gets his start in the um, with the original Celtics in the 1920s. So by 23, uh, in the 22, 23 season, the original Celtics are the premier basketball team, professional basketball team in the United States. Also, in 1923, there was a team that was founded, another barnstorming team that was called the New York Rens, short for New York Renaissance, Rens, R-E-N-S. And this was a all black team, uh, black owned, based out of Harlem. Uh, Robert Douglas, Bob Douglas was the uh, operator of the team and sort of their goal was to become the black version of the original Celtics and ultimately play and beat them. Um, They didn't have any kind of home court. They would play. uh, It looks like they played a lot at the Harlem Renaissance Ballroom in return for changing the name of the team of the New York Renaissance, they were allowed to play at the Harlem ballroom because you know the whole Harlem Renaissance thing of the 1920s. They some of the guys in the original early teams, Clarence uh, Fats Jenkins, Frank Strangler Forbes, James Pappy Ricks, they were also professional Negro League baseball players. Uh, so they ultimately the goal was to play the original Celtics. They played them five times and lost before ultimately beating them in 1923. But, you know, this was sort of, you know, the natural reaction immediately is for people to you know compare them to the Harlem Globetrotters. But this was like a real serious basketball team that barnstormed and actually did play against white teams and in the early 20s, which was, you know, not we talked about Jack uh, Jack Dempsey rather not being willing to play or not willing to defend the heavyweight title against black fighters, even though he'd fought black fighters previously. So there was no automatic that you were going to get to play white teams at this point, even in exhibition games. So you mentioned Fats Jenkins. I, I knew about the Wrens, but I didn't. Um, I didn't realize Fats Jenkins was a part of it. He's one of the guys who they've talked about as potentially a, a Hall of Famer, uh, a baseball Hall of Famer from the the Negro Leagues, who was a great left fielder. He's got uh, the second best. These stats are obviously incomplete, but the second best war in his of uh, second best war of left fielders in Negro League history. I think he's um, he also just missed out on being designated an Olympic boxer in 1920. Oh, wow. So really impressive athlete. Fats Jenkins, uh, much of his statistics are lost in baseball, but uh, at least according to the book that I'm looking here, which is a book called Negro Leaguers in the Hall of Fame, which I'll talk about when we get to baseball. um, uh, The guy who wrote the book, Steve Greens is his name. He actually considers uh, baseball to be Jenkins' second best sport. Uh, Actually, one more thing that I wanted to mention uh, before we move on from basketball, and this kind of ties in Mm -hmm. with what we're just saying. This is the era of the Black Fives, which are... Um, all black basketball teams uh, of the sort of the first half of the 19th century, you know, by and large barnstorming teams uh, centered around uh, the East Coast and also uh, the, sort of the 
you know, the Pittsburgh and Chicago areas and a lot of historical study has been done of, of these teams through the years. And there was these, what they call the colored basketball uh, world championship. And the consensus uh, colored basketball world champion for the 22, 23 season for the fourth year in the row is a, a Pittsburgh based team known as the low end L O E N D I big five. And what's interesting by that about them is they are owned and organized uh, by a gentleman by the name of Cumberland Posey who is uh, also the founder of the Homestead Grays in the Negro League baseball team. And Posey is one of only two individuals who is a part of two North American Hall of Halls of Fame, you know, the big four, because he is a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame as well as the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. And his Lewendy Big Five is the... Uh, colored uh, basketball world champion in 1923 for the fourth and last year in a row. Did you have anything else on these various uh, pro basketball leagues? No, I, like I said, I really had a lot of fun looking at some of this mm. basketball stuff, both on the college and the pro side of it. I guess. Uh, do we want to move on to baseball? Yeah, I think we're uh, we're left with the main event here. The uh, 1923 baseball season. Um Shall we start with the Negro League just to to not I don't want to say get that out of the way, but I I know the the major league, you know, white baseball season we're going to spend a lot of time on. So should shall we cover the Negro Leagues first or? Yeah. Why don't we do the Negro Leagues? Because this is uh, this is an interesting year in the in the Negro Leagues. I know I got a bunch of stuff. Is there a, a place where you'd like to start? No, this was the first year of the Eastern Colored League. I know that. Yeah. So this was the first year of the Eastern Colored League. The. Uh, the uh, Negro National League, which was um, the first uh, of the sort of what's what we consider the Negro Leagues um, and the first one that's been now considered to be a a major league that was founded in 1920 by uh, Andrew Rube Foster of the uh, Chicago American Giants. And in 1923, a second league, a competitor league uh, called the Eastern Colored League came along and, you know, as what as rival leagues did at the time, you know, and still do now occasionally when they when they come about, they took some of the players from the the NNL, the Negro National League, who uh, were sort of swiped away by the Eastern Color League. Eastern Colored League, much to the chagrin of Rube Foster, the best player in the Eastern, the best team, I should say, in the Eastern Colored League is the Hilldale Club, and they are managed by John Henry Pop Lloyd, who is the shortstop. He's older by this point. He's 39 years of age, but he still manages to play for and manage the team to the Eastern color league pennant in 1923. He was once compared to Honus Wagner and Honus Wagner himself said that he was honored by the comparison. Uh, their leading pitcher is a guy by the name of Phil Cockrell, who is a spitballer, a master of the spitball. They have two hall of fame, uh, future, uh, future hall of fame catchers, Biz Mackey, and uh, Luis Santop, Luis Santop, who is uh, at this point, he, he's uh, he's 34 years of age by this point, a native of Philadelphia. And then uh, he's he's sort of uh, th- another one of the catchers is Biz Mackey, who's, who's who's younger, who's almost a decade younger. He's 25. They have a young, uh, young third baseman, uh, Judy Johnson, in one of his first years in organized black baseball. Johnson, who is. Um, eventually inducted into the hall of fame in his own right as a third baseman goes on to play, uh, play a bunch of years with Hillsdale. And then he plays with uh, the Homestead Grays uh, with the aforementioned um, uh, with the aforementioned Homestead Grays with Cumberland Posey plays with the Pittsburgh Crawfords uh, has a really long, pro- probably the the best uh, third baseman in Negro league history. So a lot of young, really good players on this um young and older really good players on this uh first champions of the eastern colored league the uh the hilldale 
team, their counterparts in the NNL, the Negro National League, are the Kansas City Monarchs, the famed uh, one of the one of the all time uh, hallmark franchises of the the Negro National League. Um, they are are really the hallmark franchise of all of black baseball. They are managed by uh, their star pitcher, Jose Mendez, uh, native of Cuba, who actually uh, dies, uh, dies only a few years later, dies in uh, 1928. I don't know the story behind his death. I might want to look that up. But he is a he is a he is in the Hall of Fame uh, and he leads the leads the Monarchs to the to the champion. They also uh, have on the team a guy who's not in the Hall of Fame, but who somebody believe uh a lot of people believe should be a gentleman by the name of heavy Johnson, who is the starting right fielder for the team Johnson. And again, these stats are, are incomplete to a certain degree, but Johnson is the, I think he's the triple crown winner. Yeah. He's, he's the triple crown winner for the, for the Monarchs of the Negro national league this year, uh, 20 home runs, uh, 406 batting average and 120 RBIs in 98 games played some, so some really impressive, really impressive numbers for heavy Johnson. And again, Johnson is, is a, another one of these Negro leaguers who people say probably should be in the hall of fame, uh, a great uh, double play combination of uh, Newt Allen at second base, Dobie Moore at shortstop. I just want to read, I have a little bit of uh, this is about Newt Allen, the starting second baseman of the Kansas City Monarchs. It says, quote, he was always proud of being a hard-nosed player who played by the rough rules of Negro League ball. In a in an interview um, for a book on the Negro Leagues, he talked about pitchers throwing at batters, routine fisticuffs on the field, and how players often use their spikes to take out an opposing fielder. He spoke of the time when he was permanently scarred by Oscar Charleston kicking a ball out of his hand. He told another story about receiving 18 stitches after Dave Malarker spiked him and then on a subsequent force out play at second, throwing the ball directly into Malarker's forehead, proving that he could give as well as take a <laughs> lot of superstars on the Kansas City Monarchs. They also have uh, Bullet Rogan, uh, who is both a pitcher and a hitter. He is in the Hall of Fame. He's a few years ago, Joe Posnaski came out with his uh, Baseball 100 book where he talks about the 100 baseball players of 100 greatest baseball players of all time. Bullet Rogan makes that list. And I would also note that Rogan is idolized by Casey Stengel, uh, who, you know, a fellow Kansas City uh, native, Kansas City resident, however you want to look at it. So Casey Stengel, uh, no less, no, uh, no less than Casey Stengel thinks uh, very highly of um, thinks very highly of um, of uh, the great bullet Rogan. So those are the uh, the two champions um, of the Eastern Colored League and the Negro National League. They do not meet in a World Series. That would not come till the following year. And I have a really interesting mm. story that I want to tell you about that. But in this particular year, sort of like the first year of the of the American League and then uh, competing with the National League 20 some odd years earlier, they do not meet in a postseason championship. Yeah, so the like any upstart league, there's kind of the initial thing and we've talked before about how some of the the negro league owners were not exactly reputable businessmen in the first place but like you see in any league with the whether it be the american league back in the day or the afl or you know really any of these upstart leagues we've done episodes on there's a there's always a hesitance and in some cases an outright refusal for the more established league to do business with them uh, sometimes that changes, usually when it makes business sense, sometimes it never changes. And, you know, we're still in the first year of the Eastern Colored League. So the Negro National League doesn't see any real upside to lending legitimacy to that league by playing them in some kind of postseason series. Because if you win, you've just beaten a, a what you consider a, you know, a, an inferior league. And if you lose, suddenly you've now in the course of five or seven or nine games or whatever it is, you validated that league's existence as being on par with you. 
as I mentioned, this is the first year that the um, Chicago American Giants do not win the pennant of the Negro National League. In my research, I read and, and I'm trying to find the page here and I, I can't specifically locate it, but uh, Fa- some of Foster's players, because he's not only the the founder of the league and the owner of the Chicago American Giants, he's also the the manager. Some of his players are starting to tire of his autocratic ways. Uh, so that's uh, as as always happens in sports when a team was winning. They love the manager. They love the coach. But once they uh, once they start to slip, the players start to feel more comfortable in expressing their displeasure that now the, one of the interesting things about the negro leagues that i don't think people realize is that they didn't the the two leagues there's not an negro league world series for most of what we call sort of the existence mm-hmm. of the negro leagues and part of that is because you have leagues that are um sort of in and out of existence and this is another one of those areas where i there are people who are much more um much more well versed in this but the the negro national league and the eastern colored league play from 24 to 27 and then not again from until 1942 until uh 1948 and i think and that's also i think because i think the first negro national league goes out of business um in 31 the eastern colored league goes out in 28 and then they find and found that there's actually in 1932, there's really not a Negro League. It's all just barnstorming teams, by and large. Uh, but what year was that? 32. Oh wow. And but then in 33, they organize a new Negro National League, and then in 37, uh, there's a Negro American League in 1937. So it, you know, these teams are sort of in and out of existence. Uh, the East West game the all-star game is kind of the big event in Negro league baseball for, for the duration, these world series and championships tend to tend to come and go. But just to go back to the year in question, I'm hoping you don't know this because I want to see your reaction in 1924, the two teams, the two leagues come to an agreement to sort of coexist and play a, um, play a postseason championship you know who mediates the dispute between the two? Who is it? He's in the Hall of Fame as an executive. Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Oh, wow. Interesting. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that's very strange. Now, on the I, one I, hand, I, you could say that Landis was a federal judge, and so he was probably a good candidate for this. On the hmm. other hand, the guy who is known... And, and maybe to a certain degree caricatured because there was a lot more at play, but a guy who was known as the champion of uh, segregation in p- professional baseball during this time period is negotiating a truce between the two big black leagues of the 20s. Yeah, and we need to be clear about just how much of an appetite there was for integration of Major League Baseball in this era. You know, maybe 20 years later, Landis delayed it by a few years, but I don't think Kennesaw Mountain Landis was really the big thing standing in the way of baseball integrating in 1923. Not to say it's right or not, but I guess the argument would be for that was he probably wanted to see order in these other leagues as opposed to chaos, because that could only badly impact Major League Baseball if there was raids and things like that in the Negro Leagues then you know that's naturally going to impact somebody some businessmen are going to get an idea to start another major league which hadn't happened in a, in a little while at that point they put the federal league down pretty quickly you know it just fosters a climate where that kind of thing is 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 encouraged i guess you could say before we leave the negro leagues i just want to have uh one more quick story here um uh, St. Louis pitcher by the name of Fred Lefty Bell gets his kid brother, Jim, uh, age 20, a job with the St. Louis Stars as a knuckleball pitcher. On the train to Chicago, the youngster showed no nervousness at the prospect of pitching against the great Chicago American Giants. This guy's cool, the player says, and veteran pitcher uh, Bill Gatewood hands this young man the nickname Cool Papa Bell. <laughs> and that is the birth of and eventually 
Cool Papa Bell, much, much better known as a uh as a an offensive player, an outfielder, a hitter, a base runner, one of the fastest men in baseball history. A lot of people have have you know have said through the years. Gets his start as a pitcher, and uh, I had never known that before. That was the genesis of the nickname of the great Cool Papa Bell. Oh wow! And Cool Papa Bell, just to sort of digress here for a minute. There's a couple guys in Negro League Baseball. Buck Leonard is another one. Uh, cool Papa Bell doesn't pass away until 1991. And he's inducted into the Hall of Fame, I think, sometime in the late 70s. And so if you watch video of Hall of Fame inductions from the 80s where they bring back the old players, Cool Papa Bell is there. And I just have always thought it was really cool. You know, obviously, you know, considering the great historical injustice that was done, it's cool that at least some of these guys got to experience the life of just being a, a Hall of Famer. You know, it's not yeah. like, it's not like, I mean, we saw the. We saw the Hall of Fame induction of Bud Fowler a couple of years ago. Bud Fowler had been dead for like 130 years by the time he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. The fact that some of these guys were able to not only be there for induction, but, you know, go to old timers day and go, go back to the Hall of Fame, you know, 1988 and have dinner with mm-hmm. who, you know, try to try to think of somebody who was recently inducted into the Hall of Fame in, in 1980, you know, Brooks Robinson or, you know, somebody who you think of mm-hmm. as being from a completely different era i just just think that that's it's good that that happened yeah i think you're right all right so do we want to move on to sort of the main show here and talk about uh the the majors in 1923 yeah let's get let's get into that as we approach the two-hour mark here um are you surprised no no i'm not um so Major League Baseball, 1923. Um, Most of this story can be told through the lens of two teams. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other stuff you want to add to it. But, you know, we're coming off two straight years where the Yankees and the Giants have played in the World Series. Babe Ruth's been a Yankee for three years now, 1920, 1921, 1922. Made the Yankees probably the most popular team in the country, but they still can't beat the Giants in the World Series. And thought is beginning to take hold, if it hasn't already, that the style of baseball that is, you know, pushed or that is symbolized by Ruth is good for headlines and it's good for uh, the, you know, for. Babe Ruth's the Babe Ruth PR machine. But when it comes down to it in a series, scientific baseball, as they called it, what we consider kind of small ball is the way to go. And there's no better practitioner of that than uh, John Joseph McGraw over in the polo grounds. Ruth had been good in the first world series against the giants. He'd hit three thirteen, a home run four RBIs. The Yankees had lost in six games, but he had, he had still been good in. And I believe was the, was 21 still a five games of a, a best of nine series. I think it, it was, was. They, they had gone back to that for 20. It was, I think 18, 19, 20 and 21. Yeah. 21 it, was the last year of it. Yeah. And Ruth must've, I don't know a ton about this Ruth Ruth must have been hurt for a couple games here because uh, he only played in six games and the series went eight. So I I'd, I'd have to go back and see the story of that, but he must've been hurt for a couple games. 22 is when he really is terrible uh, in, in 21 plate appearances. He has only two hits, only one for extra bases, which is a double only one RBI only one run scored a batting average of 118 for the whole series. And that's, I think when McGraw brags afterwards that all they'd done is throw him slow balls and Ruth had kind of tripped over himself doing so 22 is also one of the years. And this does happen periodically where Ruth sort of starts to have some issues in his personal life and, He's, you know, his, his, his way of living. We talked about a little bit of this when we did the Dan Taylor and baseball at the abyss back over the summer in 26, when Ruth had had sort of some similar issues. This is sort of the first one of those where Ruth is quote unquote out of control, 
needs to pledge to reform. A lot of people, like you said, think that the combination of the way he plays and the way he lives could mean that his best days are behind him. So real quick, in the 21 series, Ruth had an infected arm and a bad knee, which he wrenched in game five. He did not play. He did not start game six, seven or eight. He only got in as a pinch hitter in game eight. Uh, And then 22, he starts the season suspended because of the barnstorming after the 21 World Series. We talk, it's funny because when I, I have a book here called The House That Ruth Built that I read years ago on the 23 baseball season. And we, you know, when we talked about the, the 27, 26 into 27 offseason and Ruth's bad year in 25, this kind of hung heavy in my mind because it was only three years before when almost the exact same thing had happened. Ruth, after the 22 season where the 22 World Series, where he gets embarrassed. I think there's one play where he kind of he gets tagged by the Giants and he kind of tries to like wrestle with the guy a little bit and then starts yelling at McGraw. And really, it's clear that the Giants and McGraw specifically are under Ruth's skin and it's affecting his play. Ruth goes to a banquet after the 22 season and says at, the quote is something along the lines of I've had my last drink until the spring. Uh, I'm going back to my farm to work and basically disappears and goes back to his farm in Massachusetts. And nobody sees or hears too much of him again until he emerges for spring training down South at the start of the 23 season. At that banquet, he is, berated by a uh, New York uh, politician, a state senator by the name of Jimmy Walker, who later um, is uh, mayor of New York City from 1926 to 1932. Walker is widely considered to be the most corrupt mayor in New York City history. While he was mayor. But so the sort of backdrop to this, too, is... The last two World Series, the Yankees have been tenants at the Polo Grounds. The World Series are there. Every game is played at the Polo Grounds. The Yankees, and we won't go back to time in memoriam. The Yankees move or get established in New York in 1903. They play up at Hilltop Hilltop Park in northern Manhattan. Stadium burns down at one point. They move into the polo grounds. And I want to say around 1914, we could look that up exactly, but let's say it's around 1914 and they're an also ran in the American league. The giants are the class of New York city in, you know, there's not, as we've talked about, there's not a ton of other professional sports. The Dodgers are way out in Brooklyn and not particularly good for the most part. The giants are the elite New York team really in all of sports. The, the Yankees are the team that plays there when the Giants are on the road, their tenants. Pretty much the way it goes all through World War II, all through World War I, excuse me. Um, in, the, in 1920, the, the Yankees acquire Babe Ruth. The Yankees start to outdraw the Giants in, uh, in the polo grounds. So this is a source of great embarrassment for the Giants. In the 1921 season, They basically give the Yankees their walking papers that you have to be out by the end of this year. Some deals get arranged where that gets worked on to the point where the Yankees are allowed to stay through the 1922 season. The other thing that happens during all this is the Giants owners do everything in their power to block any parcel of land that the two Yankees owners, Jacob Rupert and... The guy I've never heard his name pronounced, but T- Tillinghouse Limadu or whatever it is, um, they are trying to find a place in Manhattan to build their new park to showcase Babe Ruth. And this is still it's the waning days of this, but this is still Tammany Hall, New York City. And the Stonems are in much more closely with Tammany Hall than Jacob Rupert is. And they every time they think they have a spot, they're told, well, no, you can't close this street. Well, no, this, you know, there's this easement or whatever. And they ultimately end up with a parcel of land just across from the polo grounds in the Bronx, which 
is built in time for the 1923 season. And Jacob Rupert, maybe he doesn't have as good a political connections as the Stonems. That's despite the fact and I didn't find this out until a few years ago. Jacob Rupert served in Congress for eight years and at the beginning part of the century. Really? I, I didn't know that either. Yeah. It should also be noted that Jacob Rupert is a German immigrant, which is certainly in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Uh, or gee, I keep doing that. I mean, true then, too. But let's um, in the immediate aftermath of World War One, I, I guess he there was never he was very clearly pro-American and things like that. But um, he was also his fortune was made brewing Knickerbocker beer. And we're now in prohibition. So he's got plenty of other factors that are weighing heavily upon him as he um, tries to build his baseball empire, not the least of which is that he also doesn't get along with his co-owner. Yeah, that, and, it, and it was funny. I was about to mock the way you pronounced his name, but you actually came pretty close. So, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something along that line. I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it. <laughs> So that that's sort of, you know, the the Yankees have their their own park being built just across the river from the polo grounds in the Bronx. You know, there's the funny quote that obviously would not come true, but it was still kind of seen that even though it was right across the river, that was an outer borough. You know, New York City was still considered by a lot of people to be Manhattan at the time. You know, Brooklyn had been its own city until the late 1900s, late 1800s. Um, I think there's a quote from McGraw where he basically says, like, well, they'll go out and play in Cowtown, even though you can literally see the two stadiums from each other. (laughs) Um, So, you know, backfires a little on the Giants that not only do they get a they get rid of the Yankees. Yes, but the Yankees are going to build a stadium right across the river from them and is going to dwarf the polo grounds in size and probably not coincidentally. Basically, right as soon as the season starts, the Giants begin construction in the middle of the season on a massive uh, on a massive renovation and capacity increase to the polo grounds. And they build the Yankee Stadium gets built quick. I see here 284 days. That's like less than nine months. They really build the thing quick, especially for the 20s. Yep. So. You know, I don't know where you want to start with that, but with this, but that's sort of the backdrop of it. Um, you know, the two teams that have won the pennant the last two years playing now, they were previously sharing a city. Now they're just playing right on opposite sides of the river, sort of two opposing schools of baseball in terms of the, you know, the, the knock them over the wall, Babe Ruth style and the, scientific baseball scratch out runs you know of the uh of the new york giants under john mcgraw yeah i guess maybe we should first sort of talk about the uh hold on oh there's a there's an article in here i this is it's a saber book um that came out it's a compilation it's not by a single author Uh, it's called uh yankee stadium america's first modern ballpark and i i want to particularly plug this book because there are two articles in this book written by me, uh, one <laughs> on um, one on Babe Ruth's sort of post Yankee career life at Yankee Stadium, his various appearances up through the end of his life and his funeral. And then the other cool thing about this book is that they actually expanded it all. So it was everything that happened at Yankee Stadium, not just baseball. And so I wrote a book about the uh or, I'm sorry, I wrote a, an article, I should say, about the 1962 NFL uh, championship game between Green Bay and the Yankees. One of the sites the um, Yankees looked to build the stadium on before they ended up in the Bronx was the site of a building that was, uh, you know, I guess they were going to tear down or whatever that was in disrepair, wasn't being used anymore. And I just find it funny because the name of the building contains three words that you probably it's three words long and you can't really use any of those words to describe something anymore. It was called the Hebrew Orphan Asylum. <laughs> I mean, I guess in certain contexts you can say Hebrew, but you definitely can't ever say orphan or asylum anymore. I feel like this. I don't know. Is orphan that that considered that uh, that? Yeah. That yeah. They don't really say that anymore. Oh, OK. Well, I was not aware of that. Okay, so 
do you want to talk a little bit about the opening of the the opening day in Yankee Stadium? Maybe is a good a good place to start with this. April eighteenth, nineteen twenty three. Sure. And if you grew up where we grew up, if you went into any like pizza place, there was a picture of the opening day of Yankee Stadium with all the cars out front that said circa 1923 on it. So they open against the Red Sox, um, you know, the big sort of fest, you know, big sort of pageantry. There's the military bands. John Philip Sousa is there. They raise the 1922 American League Championship banner. Ruth gets all kinds of awards. The governor's there. Very famously, Ruth said that he, you know, Ruth was asked his opinion of the stadium and he just said some ball yard. And Yankee Stadium was much grander in scale than any other stadium at the time. And it was, Mm -hmm. I think that's what needs to be. There were big parks back then, but we're still in the era of really wood parks and some of them had big capacities and things but a lot of them had been patchworks over the years and you know different add-ons that weren't really connected this was the first one that was built in such a massive roman-esque feel and it conveyed sort of the decade the team the star the city uh it was just big and grandiose and ruth hits a home run in, in the first game in the stadium. He hits the first home run. And he had said that he would give a home run, give a year off his life to hit a home run. Yep. So he hits a three run home run into the right field stands. Later, the stadium would be dubbed the house that Ruth built for various reasons, mostly because the, you know, the money raised by the Yankees and the fact that, uh, the fact that the Giants, you know, threw them out be- largely because of their performance under Babe Ruth. There's sort of been a, there's been a bit of a, not revisionist history, but misunderstanding that this stadium was the best thing that ever happened to Babe Ruth. And in reality, Ruth has quotes years later that said, I, I cried when they took me out of the polo grounds because with those, there was a short porch in right field at Yankee Stadium. There was a short porch in left field and right field at the polo grounds, and they were much shorter. <laughs> And I think, in fact, in the World Series that year in 23, when he goes back to the polo grounds to play for the first time, he says something along the lines of, I'd hit 80 home runs this year if I'd played at this park. A couple of just other quick things. 150 reporters attend the grand opening at Yankee Stadium. The official attendance is initially reported at 74,200, but they later correct that to only 62,200. So they they mark it down by 12,000. Uh, John Philip Souza directs the seventh regiment band uh, to play uh, the star spangled banner before the game. The Boston Red Sox, the opponent are managed by hall of fame, first baseman, uh, Frank chance and Frank chance raises the American flag right before uh, Miller Huggins, the Yankee manager raises the uh, 1992, uh, I'm sorry, 1922 American league pennant. And the Yankees and Ruth are on their way to a pennant winning season where they uh, will rematch against the New York Giants uh, for the third time in a row in the World Series. I think this and I want to talk a little bit just about a few things from the season before we get to the World Series. But I think this is the only time three two teams play three years in a row in the World Series because I don't think the Yankees in Brooklyn never do it. No. One quote that I really liked that I always find from that opening day at Yankee Stadium um, said uh, there were a few snafus, as would be expected on the new stadium's opening day. Yale basketball coach Joe Fogarty had reserved a box for himself and several other minor dignitaries. But when they showed at 115, Fogarty found his seats had been sold. He demanded an audience with Ed Barrow, who was harried with a thousand last minute details. There's nothing doing, roared Bulldog Ed, and a nearby coach ushered the coach, a nearby cop ushered the coach out of the stadium. So I just like that quote. (laughs) I'm not going to go back and look, but if you're listening, you can go back. I don't know if in those couple of paragraphs that I read. I don't know if if Yale was mentioned in there, but uh, feel Mm. free to go back and listen, see how they did that year. So um, this is, yeah, I don't think, I don't think there's ever been a team teams that have played three years in a row since then, because it would almost have to be the Yankees. And I'm pretty, I'm I'm, in fact, I'm 99% sure it's never happened. The, uh, and I'm just thinking other sports, hockey, it's possible. Um, 
certainly hasn't happened in the NFL in the football in the Super Bowl era. In fact, I think the only time you got two in a row in the Super Bowl era was was uh, Dallas and Buffalo in the 90s. But you, you got it in the NBA. I'm sure you got it in the 60s with the Lakers and the Celtics. And then you got it. Um, you got it with with Cleveland and the and the and Golden State, uh, you know, a few years back. But I think it's the only time ever in the World Series. Um Maybe a little bit uh, before we get back to the Yankees, just a little bit on on sort of the rest of baseball. It's not a particularly competitive uh, season uh, in either. You know, the Yankees beat the Tigers uh, 80 uh, by 16 games. Detroit managed by Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb had been managing the Tigers in addition to playing for the last couple of years. They finish at 83 and 71. They're 16 games back. The Giants um, do a little better or have a little bit of a closer race in the National League, I should say. They're they're four and a half back of the Cincinnati Reds, uh, 95 and 58 for the Giants, 91 and 63 for the the Reds. Um, The Giants have uh, won what would be their third of four pennants in a row. This is the first the, the the following year. This is actually the second year that the American League had named a most valuable player award. The National League doesn't start giving one until 1924. The year before the Yankees had had a very surprising pennant race. They, they'd won the um, American League by only one game over the St. Louis Browns, who sort of came out of nowhere and had one of the best seasons in the history of that franchise. They were led in 1922 by George Sisler, who was named the very first American league MVP and batted 420 that year for the St. Louis Browns. The reason I mentioned that in the context in 1923 is that Sisler actually does not play at all in 1923. After having such a great year in 20, uh, 22, he suffers from a sinusitis, which causes double vision and, leads to his missing the entire season of 1923. He actually comes back uh, in 24 and and plays a few more years in St. Louis and a few more years, some other places, but the first ever American league MVP of uh, in George Sisler does not get to play uh, the following year in 23. He gives up the, uh, the MVP crown to Babe Ruth. Now this was a year this was a time period in which a team, a player could only win the MVP one time. And so Sisler would not have been eligible even had he played in 23. This is Babe Ruth's lone MVP year. And I think does he, he he's not a triple crown winner in 23. He, um, he only manages 41 home runs. He had hit 59 in 21. So he's, he's, behind the 50s total that he would have and the 60 that he would hit in 27 as well. But he still leads all of baseball with uh, 41 home runs, leads all of baseball with 130 RBIs. And Babe Ruth has his best ever uh, batting average with a 393 batting average in 1929, although that's actually not even best in the American League. Harry Heilman of Detroit hits uh, hits four uh, 403. There, this really is like you said. It's a season dominated by the Yankees and the Giants. I, there's really not a, a a lot else that I can see, at least that's sort of worth uh, worth mentioning for from baseball. Dolph Luque, uh, who um, uh, becomes the first uh, one of the first Cuban stars in Major League Baseball. Uh, leads the major leagues in uh, wins. He has 27 wins uh, and also leads in ERA with a 1.93 ERA for the, for the Cincinnati Reds, a, a guy who I know very little about by the name of George Yule or Yule, U-H-L-E um, leads the American league with 26 wins uh, for the Cleveland Indians. Uh, Rogers Hornsby wins the batting title. Um, a guy by the name. Here's another one. Cy Williams of the Philadelphia Phillies uh, ties Ruth for the major league lead in home runs with with 41 home runs for a a very mediocre Philadelphia Phillies team. I, I shouldn't even say mediocre. A, a team that wins only 50 games, but he somehow um, 
he somehow manages 41 home runs, the by far the highest in his career. The next uh, highest he hits is 30, uh, 30 in 1927 for a Philadelphia Phillies team that wins 50 games and loses 104. They're like 50 games out of first place. So he, but he manages to tie Babe Ruth in 1923 for the uh, National League uh, or for the Major League uh, home run lead. So, yeah, I just I, not a lot of compelling stories in Major League Baseball other than Ruth, the Yankees, and the rivalry with the Giants. Yeah, a couple of things on Dolph Luque. Um, you know, he was one of those. He was a Latin, but he was considered light skinned enough to pitch. Which, like I say, sometimes that's almost grosser because like somebody was making that determination. He also. Once after a critical error by teammate Babe Pinelli, Luke Luke chased Babe around the clubhouse with an ice pick. He also one time they was getting razzed by the Giants dugout and mid pitch. He ran into the dugout and punched Casey Stangle square in the mouth. Um, It said Stangle claimed innocence in mocking Luke. He also admitted ruefully that he was one of the most likely suspects. Um, so yeah, Luke did lots of uh, talk a little bit more about Casey in a few minutes too. Yes. So just, just a few different things there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those seasons where it's, it's, you almost can't get it anymore with all the rounds of playoffs, but the whole year seems like it's building towards a third round of the giants and the Yankees. And Everything along the way is just sort of preamble to that. I want to spend just a second before we get to the series. I want to talk a little bit about this 23 Yankee team because they are the first team ever to win a World Series uh, for the Yankees. And there'd, there'd be 26 more. This is a little bit of a different team. Some of the Hall of Famers in the lineup that you see in later years. Gehrig's not really there yet. We'll talk a little bit about Gehrig maybe in a minute. Earl Combs. uh is not really there yet. This is still a team with guys like Wally Pip and Everett Scott and a catcher by the name of uh, Wally Shang, a, a really good pitching staff, um, future, uh, future hall of famers in Wait Hoyt and Herb Pennick. They Carl Mays, who's unfortunately best known for throwing a pitch that killed somebody a few years earlier, still on the team is being used sparingly by Miller Huggins because Miller Huggins. And I just found this out. Miller Huggins thought that Carl Mays might've thrown some games in the 1921 world series. So he's soured on Carl Mays by this point, but um, Herb Pennick, uh, who's the only lefty on the, uh, in the starting rotation or maybe on the whole pitching staff finishes 19 and six. Another pitcher by the name of Sam Jones is 21 and eight throws a no hitter against the Philadelphia A's Wally Pip, who uh, is unfortunately best known for being um, the guy who eventually lost his spot to Lou Gehrig is hits three Oh four. He's second on the team in RBIs with 109. Wally Pip is, is a really good player uh, for some people that don't realize. Also Gehrig comes up to the team late in the season in 1923 and Wally Pip works with Lou Gehrig even though he knows that this is the guy who's probably going to take his job. Wally Pip tutors him. He works with him. So, um, you you know, maybe, maybe somebody who's worth talking more about in some context in a future episode, but Wally Pip, a a key player on this 23 Yankees team. The Yankees actually tried to add Gehrig to the world series roster, but they'd already submitted it. And I'm not going to be able to find the quote quickly enough, but McGraw says something along the lines of if the Yankees have had an injury, that's their problem. (laughs) Basically (laughs) saying that they're not doing it. So one thing I wanted to touch on before the World Series, and this is in this book I'm reading. It's an older book by Robert Weintraub. It's called The House That Ruth Built. It's all about the 23 season. Great book. Is this about the exhibition game? Yeah. So go ahead and I'm going to read a little. So basically, the Yankees actually had a lot of time off before the World Series because back then they would schedule time for rainouts because if you rained a game out in St. Louis, you couldn't just get back there on an off day. You know, so you needed to have time to go make them up. So the Yankees didn't have a ton of those. and They'd already clinched the pennants. They had some time off. Um, It says on October 1st, the Giants got their first close up look at the concrete behemoth across the river, holding a two hour practice at Yankee Stadium, et cetera, et cetera. Then came a game in circumstance, which seems utterly bizarre to the modern eye. On October 3rd, an exhibition game pitted the minor league Baltimore Orioles against a combined team 
of Yankees and Giants at the Polo Grounds, wearing an ill-fitting Giants uniform borrowed from Jack Scott and taking orders from John McGraw, for, it was Babe Ruth. Incredibly, with a World Series that promised to border on the homicidal starting in exactly one week, the signature personalities were on the same side in a meaningless exhibition game. Even more amazing, Ruth had get rolled his right ankle getting off a train in Boston a few days before, and he still played. So just interesting. And maybe it's because it's the Baltimore Orioles and he's got a soft spot for them because uh, that's where he got his you know initial start in pro baseball. I don't know, but it says the yeah. contest... O- the contest benefited former Giants owner John T. Brush, who was battling dementia, and Ruth lent his name to the gate, as he did countless times for causes, great and small. And I'll use this opportunity to mention the John T. Brush Memorial Staircase is still the only remaining structure, even tangentially related to the polo grounds that you can still find in Harlem. So they opened the World Series uh, Game 1 at Yankee Stadium. Or, yeah, g- Game 1 is at Yankee Stadium. Do they go back and forth in this one? It looks like they do, right? Yeah, I guess they had agreed on it. Um, yeah, so they they did play. Uh, they did go back and forth game by game by game. The date is October 10th and also without an off day. In those days, you only had an off day if you needed a travel day. You didn't take an off day just for the just for the sake of it. Um some of the uh attendees at this game uh Kennesaw Mountain Landis obviously the as well as Ben Johnson and John John Hadler the presidents of the American and the National League uh famed boxing promoter Tex Rickard who we talked about a little bit before um great baseball players Christy Matthewson who died only a couple of years later Connie Mack Branch Rickey uh George Stallings who'd managed the Miracle Braves uh Roger Bresnahan and Johnny Evers Hall of Famers all of them this is the um one of the first World Series broadcast on radio. It's the first one broadcast by Graham McNamee, who is sort of one of the considered the father of, of baseball on the radio. I think he he um he broadcast World Series through the through the twenties. McNamee actually doesn't start broadcasting games till later in the series. It's somebody else who does the first couple of games. Have you heard the story about McGraw and the the dressing? Oh, yeah, we were just about to talk about that. Um, McGraw would not let his players dress in the Yankee Stadium clubhouse. So they had to dress at the polo crowns and walk across the uh, walk across, I guess, the McCombs Dam Bridge to Yankee Stadium in their uniform to go now it's not a far walk but to go play game one of the world series he hated the yankees in the american league so much he would not let his team use their locker room he's another one we need to do we need to do more on him at some point so uh, recognizing the time i think we want to sort of just kind of yes get through some of this uh game one wait hoyt against mule watson for the for the Giants, uh, the game remain the game remain is tied at four going into the ninth inning when Casey Stengel hits an inside the park solo home run. Yankee third baseman Joe Dugan hears Casey rounding third, yelling to himself, "Go Casey, go!" He slides into home plate. He thumbs his nose at the Yankee dugout, which I think is essentially considered an obscene gesture at the time. There's talk that maybe Stengel should be disciplined, but nothing ever comes of it. Uh, No less of a figure than Babe Ruth after the game says, I don't mind what happened. Casey's a lot of fun. And uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis says, quote, Casey Stengel can't help being Casey Stengel. So it is one nothing Giants uh, going into game two, which is a win for the New York Yankees. Uh, starting pitchers in that one are Herb Pennick for the Yankees, another Hall of Famer, and Hugh McQuillan for the Giants. Yankees win this one 4-2. I think the biggest thing here is Babe Ruth hits two home runs. He becomes the first player in history to hit home runs uh, in a World Series game in uh, back-to-back at-bats. And 
we can another guy who hit a home run in this game was Irish Musil from the uh, Giants. His brother Bob Musil was on the Yankees. Um, one of my favorite stories from this book: they shared an apartment, but they were barely home together because one of them was usually on the road. Mm-hmm. And the Bob Musil was a man of few words, even to his brother, I guess. And Irish Musil was much more gregarious. And I guess there was a time when I forget who it was, but I think it was. Irish Musil came home from like a 10 day road trip out West with the giants. He got home and without saying a word, Bob Musil just got up and went on his own 10 day road trip. So like they saw each other for like a minute and they didn't say a word to each other. The other thing I wanted to just mention briefly. No, real quick though. I do have to say that is only the second best brothers who are New York athletes sharing an apartment story. The best is still that Brooke Lopez and Robin Lopez couldn't live together because their cats didn't get along. <laughs> um. The press coverage in this, and there's obviously swarming press, and a lot of them are are much more entwined with McGraw than because he's been giving them stories for years. But basically, after every game, because the first few games rotate wins, they're just they're not only declaring like the team that won better, they're declaring the style of baseball superior based on one game. It's like McGraw showed that the scientific baseball is, you know, is far superior to Ruth's uh, gargantuan and clout. And then the next game, it's like, who cares if you can bunt them over if the other guy's knocking them over the wall or whatever. So I guess we'll move to game three where they swing back to Yankee Stadium. And again, it's a Giants win. Giants one win, to nothing. shut out yep. one nothing. There's talk that uh there's talk that uh, Bob Musial, uh, who we just talked about, who's actually hitting cleanup for the Yankees here, because like we said, these are the pre Garrick days. Uh, Bob Musial uh, maybe misses a bunt sign. Let me let me find this is actually maybe worth. Um, the Yankees had an opportunity in the fourth for a potentially big inning. Joe Dugan doubles. Babe Ruth uh, walks on four straight pitches. And with the cleanup hitter up and nobody out and two runners on, Miller Huggins still gives a bunt signal. Baseball... Even in the 20s, baseball was still, you know, still a lot of times about moving the runners along. Musial misses the sign, hits into a double play. That's sort of the Yankees' best chance to score. They lose two to one. And they're going back, uh, going back to the polo grounds for game four, uh, where they actually jump out to an eight-nothing lead. Hold on to win eight to four. Interestingly enough, in game three, and I don't know, like I said, we're getting late here and I don't know um, what the story is. Babe Ruth actually plays first base at the end of game three, which I don't think ever happened. You know, I don't know how much. Yeah, yeah. Ruth replaced Pip at first base at some point in game three, which is Ruth didn't play a lot of first base. But anyway, Yankees win game four, eight to four. And uh behind a solid pitching performance by Bob Shockey and a save by a uh, future hall of famer, Herb Pennick. And now the series is knotted up uh, going back to Yankee stadium for game five. So we've had four games. They've rotated wins. The road team has won all four games. So it's still very much anybody's series. The Yankees have won game four convincingly both giant wins have been by one run. And really this is sort of where the series flips it and becomes all Yankees. Um, Game five at Yankee Stadium, the Yankees win their first World Series game at at Yankee Stadium. Uh, They score three runs in the first, four in the second. So they're up seven to one at the end of the second inning. Uh, They got Joe Dugan hit a three run inside the park home run. The Giants end up with just three hits and the Yankees win it going away uh, eight to one. Really a, a laugher from the start. And the next day, the series shifts to the polo grounds with the Yankees on the doorstep of their first championship. Real quick on game five, Grantland Rice, who's a legendary sports writer years later, obviously the namesake for Bill Simmons uh, ESPN website, Grantland writes. And I don't even know what he's really saying in this, but uh, so be it. He's talking about the pitching performance of, bullet joe bush the yankees starting pitcher he said against this display of stuff any belated hope of a giant rally went glimmering where the woodbine twineth and the wang doodle mourns its requiem yeah that's that means nonsense. he was pitching well um so then we go into game six both teams with a run early uh ruth had a two out home run in the first inning giants tied it uh at one 
The Giants eventually are up four to one going into the seventh inning. They get a run in the fourth, a run in the fifth, a run in the sixth. Then in the eighth, the Yankees explode. Um, two walks, then three straight, or excuse me, two singles, three straight walks. Then Ruth actually strikes out with the score still four to three. Muso comes up after him and hits a two out single, giving the Yankees a six to four lead. That holds up with a Sam Jones relief appearance in the eighth and the ninth. The Yankees shut the door. They win this game with six runs on five hits because of all the walks. And the Yankees have their first world championship. Uh, they defeat the Giants. Uh, it's the first, you know, time in, in of the three that they get a championship. And it's it's seen as sort of a turning point in hindsight. Although, you know, when you look back to it was the Giants who were back in the World Series the next year, but but uh, you know at the time the, the Yankees were seen as we finally have slayed the beast. And in the clubhouse after the game, Babe Ruth presents his manager Miller Huggins with a diamond ring uh, on behalf of all of the players as a thank you for the season and a congratulations. And even McGraw says something along the lines to the media later. He says something along the lines of him having to maybe change his style because it doesn't make sense to do what he's doing. If the other guys are hitting them all over the place or something like that. So. Yeah. And I think within a couple of years, they'll bring in Mel Ott who ends up hitting 500 uh, home runs in his career and Bill Terry, who eventually takes over from McGraw as manager. So they do go the power hitting route. Eventually that's 1923. Yeah. Um, probably can listen to it in almost a third of the time it took to get through the actual 1923. So, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot there. Yeah, but we knew else. We knew this was coming with this episode. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, We're we're trying to think of some good uh, some good years to do next year. So if anybody has any suggestions, please do. uh, Please do let us know. But this was fun. Uh, We really enjoyed. uh, We really enjoyed uh, yet another travel back in time to give you a deep dive into a year this time uh a century ago in 1923 yep and uh you know it's if you have any suggestions especially if they end in fours or nines next year would be the year for us to cover them so exactly exactly well this is uh this is our last episode this is our last regular episode of the year um this will probably post sometime in december and um we really appreciate another year. We'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit more. Obviously, we'll be doing a memoriam coming up, but uh, we did a lot of fun stuff uh, as part of part of the the regular show year before we go we dive into in memoriam. So, thank you all for listening. Uh, we we're going on uh, going on our fourth year of doing this, so it's been uh, been a lot of fun. And uh, and that's just tonight. <laughs> uh, until uh, until the next one, I'm Dan Newman, and I'm Andrew Newman. Goodbye, old sports. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, Here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Join George Bozica, the president of the PFRA, and myself, John Bozica, each month for the Professional Football Researchers Association official podcast. We'll discuss the history of the game, the many names of the game, and so many different things for you, making the history of football not only entertaining, but fun at the same time as we join you on the Sports History Network on the official PFRA podcast. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.